Okay, regular items. First up is Asian Bistro, first and third class restaurant bar licenses. Yes, good evening. Um, so these are three applications, um, all renewals. Um, the only difference is Arrow Valley, where now the, the city is now issuing tobacco and tobacco endorsement license. But the other ones are, are just a renewal from last year. Okay, three renewals. I think none of them are present. No. And there's no concerns with any of them. No. Are there any questions from council? No. And any questions from members of the public? Let me get my thing open so I can see who's here. Okay. Well, would someone like to make a motion to approve all three items? I move. Second. Motion by Jim, second by Aurora. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Very easy. That's the end of the Liquor Control Board meeting. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? Boom. Second. A uh, motion by Bryn, second by Jim. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Motion carries. It is 6.02 p.m. I will now call to order the Winooski City Council meeting. Uh, first up is agenda review. Any concerns about the order of the evening? No. Okay. Uh, next up is public comment. So this is a chance for attendees who are here, not for an item on the agenda, um, but if there's something else you want to make public com want to make comment on, now would be the time. If you're here for an agenda item, please wait until we reach that item. I know we have, well, we have someone registered for the public hearing. I don't see any public attendees for this part of the meeting yet. Okay. Oops. Next up is our consent agenda. We have city council and liquor control board minutes from February 6th, the accounts payable warrant from February 16th, and the payroll warrant from January 22nd to February 4th. Any questions or concerns about the consent agenda? Can I, um, I missed the liquor control portion. So can we split that into two items? Yes. Thanks. Any other, uh, okay. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the liquor control board minutes of 2623? So moved. Motion by Bryn, second by Thomas. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those abstaining? Uh, abstain. Did you say aye, Aurora? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, and then do I have a motion to approve the city council minutes and payroll awards? So moved. Second. second. Motion by Aurora, second by Thomas. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries, thank you. <laughs> council reports. Thomas, would you like to go first? Uh, sure. Um, so, you may have seen on some of the social media posts, but if you have not, um, downtown Winooski is looking to hire a new executive director. Um, the current director um, will be leaving um, in several months, so we're trying to get ahead of that and get somebody hired up. Um, so if you are interested, you can go to downtownwinooski.org, and the application and the materials that you need to submit with it are all posted there. Um, we have received some applicants, but very excited to continue to uh, receive more and um, uh, just a big thank you to Meredith and all the work that she's done for downtown Winooski. Um, yeah, that's my update. Thank you. Yeah. Jim? Um, so I'll, I don't have any updates from commission work because the housing commission hasn't met. I'll just say, um, I guess this is my farewell. So I'll say thank you to my federal counselors and the mayor for the time that we've gotten to work together over the last one, two, four years. Um, so it's been uh, an honor to serve here in Winooski. And it's kind of interesting to reflect back on 2019, which was half of my younger daughter's life ago. Um, <laughs> things are very different. And when I joined council, what I got interested in was uh, keeping things going that had been set in motion. I felt like the city had done a lot of great work to set up a master plan to set uh, important votes around regional dispatch, around the pool, around Main Street revitalization, um, thinking ahead for economic development for the city. And that was what I wanted to kind of keep moving forward and make sure we didn't falter or change course too drastically and lose all the work that this community had done. And I'm excited today that we have a pool and I already have a pool pass for the season. Um, I'm excited that we have uh, important votes being taken tonight on Main Street with vitalization and continuing to move that forward. And I also am just cognizant of how much has changed in that time and how much we still have to do. Um, so I wanna thank you all for continuing to do that work uh, and for allowing me to be a part of that work. And um, I guess I've just been moved by how this city works together and how working together has gotten things done for this city. And I think that um, there's something to be said for uh, finding a way to be together and work together. And I've, I've enjoyed that about that part of being on the city council, maybe more than anything else. So 
thank you to the residents, thank you to you all, and thank you for um, the opportunity to be here. And thank you, I should say, thank you, Elaine, for joining and jumping in so confidently and um, for being kind of a great uh, bookend to this adventure of mine. And I look forward to seeing what you keep doing. So thank you, everybody. And that is my update. Well, thank you, Jim. <laughs> you have served for four years. Um, I think like housing, equity, community engagement, trees, climate, um, all these things wouldn't be where they are today without you. Really appreciate your thoughtful and strategic approach um, as, as a wonderful deputy mayor for at least two years, I think. Oh my God, one. It's only one? Okay, yeah. anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> You've always been really reliable. Um, keep us on process. Um, everything that you just called out, I think, has been really successful and, and more so because of you. So just wanted to acknowledge your contributions and we'll be messed up here. Thank you. I know we'll see you at least on tree committee, I think. That, I hope continue. <laughs> <laughs> um, for my updates, uh, we had a finance commission meeting last week. They gave us some input on the budget presentation, which I'm hoping we can implement for tomorrow's virtual presentation, if not um, certainly the one before town meeting day, uh, to be more accessible to the community. Um, Elaine and I were able to meet with a group of high school students who are doing a, a community-based class. Um, essentially, we're, we heard some interest from them and we're brainstorming ways to try to engage them in an actual city project. So you'll be hearing more about that in the future. Um, and then I want to remind you all that I'm still hosting that monthly housing roundtable call with some of our local housing partners. And um, we are, anecdotally, there's been an increase in families seeking emergency housing support. So we are actually leveraging this call next, next month to try to coordinate around that and make sure that agencies in our school and us are all aligned on things. So I'll share more after that happens too. Um, and there's a planning commission meeting on Thursday to continue looking at the section of form-based code with changes related to parking and historic preservation. Uh, 6.30 p.m. You can come here. You can also join via Zoom. Bryn. Sure. The uh, Municipal Infrastructure Committee um, Commission didn't meet last week um, because we had some conflicts with the abatement um, meeting as well as the Development Review Board meeting. So instead we didn't have enough um content for an agenda this month so we um decided to cancel um Chittin Salt waste district has a meeting tomorrow um it'll be a one item agenda um on the agenda for uh getting the council or getting the district um members to approve uh the staff to move forward with bonding for the news for the materials recovery facility so that will just be um, an online meeting tomorrow evening. And the next meeting to go over the Chittin Solid Waste District budget will be March 8th. So that will be coming up pretty quickly as well. Um, and then um, also just wanted to extend my gratitude and thanks to Councilor Duncan. It's really been an honor to serve with you for the last two years and um, leaving some big shoes to fill. So thank you for all that you've done. Thank you, Pamela. All right. All right. Um, so this week, so Thursday at 6 p.m., we'll have our February meeting of inclusion and belonging. This was shifted back because of some of the budget presentations, and we'll really be focusing on the equity audit, which ties a bit as well into um, our equity assessment, which we're talking about later in this meeting. So if folks want to join, that is going to be via Zoom. Um, always welcome to have public comment and engagement on that. Uh, also, uh, last week we had a meeting of the Safe Healthy. Last week, it might have been the week before that, actually. <laughs> Time has gone away with me, uh, for me. Um, we had a meeting of Safe Healthy Connected People. Uh, primarily, we got the commission was given a FY24 budget update, so both the chiefs and Ray were able to kind of catch the commission up on everything that's uh, happening for town meeting day on that. And we also did a review of a community service program need slash interest survey survey plan review. Uh, I think we're doing a little bit more polish up, polishing up on that, but that will be going out to the community. Um, I think in the next uh, month or so. So. 
definitely keep an eye on that, especially if you have feedback um, about some of our community service programs. Thank you. Elaine, city updates? Yes. So town meeting day is coming up. As a reminder, the election is on Tuesday, March 7th. Voting takes place at the Winooski Senior Center from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Early voting and absentee ballots will be available after February 17th at the city clerk's office. Uh, for all ballot and budget details, you may visit winooskivt.gov slash town meeting. As a reminder, all legal residents, regardless of your citizen citizenship status, can vote on town meeting day. Translated ballots will be available in 11 languages. If you still need to register to vote, please visit winooskivt.gov slash vote for details or stop by the city clerk's office for information. If you have questions, call or email 802-655-6410 or clerk at winooskivt.gov. Uh, be sure to visit uh, to join us for the upcoming budget presentations. The city and school virtual budget presentation will be um, tomorrow night as the time of recording, Wednesday, February 26th at 6 p.m. via Zoom. And the annual town meeting day budget presentation is Monday, March 6th at 6 p.m. at the Winooski School District Performing Arts Center. And again, visit winooskivt.gov slash town meeting for all ballot budget and meeting information. Uh, this is an announcement that the clerk's office is temporarily for the foreseeable future until further notice, uh, different hours than usual. So it will be open to the public Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. It will be closed to the public on Tuesdays. Um, those of you who have meetings with other staff in the in City Hall can certainly still make those meetings for, for Tuesdays during that staff person's hours. Uh, this is because of a temporary uh, staff shortage. And on behalf of staff, thank you to Jim also for your service to Winooski and helping bring me on and also to help with the through lines in the past and the present. It's been much appreciated. Thank you, Elaine. Okay. So we're on to regular items. First up is the public hearing on proposed changes to chapter five of the municipal code. Welcome, Eric. Good evening. Would you like to do an, a, an overview refresher for those who are new to the discussion? Sure, yeah, I'll just do a quick update and overview here. Um, thank you very much. This is a public hearing for uh, to take public comments on proposed changes to chapter five of the municipal code related to sidewalk use. This is an item that you've uh, previously reviewed at your meetings on January 17th and, the, and January 23rd, uh, where you provided comments and feedback on these uh, on these proposed changes. Additionally, um, since the oh, sorry at your meeting on the 23rd, you did schedule a public hearing for tonight. After that meeting, I forwarded the draft of the proposal to our our attorney for any comments or input from from him. You'll notice that the draft that was included with the agenda does have some text that's highlighted in yellow. Those are additions that he recommended uh, be included mostly for clarification. So I don't believe any of them are substantive and don't actually change the intent, but help clarify the, the overall language and the overall intent of the, of the document. So um, other than that, this is uh, on for a public hearing tonight. Um, because this is an amendment to the municipal code, it does require a 30 day period before it can become effective. So it, if the, the, the changes that are proposed would be effective for sidewalk use April 1st. So in order to meet that deadline, action would need to be taken tonight. That's not to say you're required to take action tonight. You can hold off and hold more hearings if you'd like, but in order to make in order to make these regulations effective for April 1st, we would need to take action tonight. So again, it's not a requirement, but just so that you're aware of the timeline related to, to this proposal. Uh, otherwise, we also have uh, this item is for the public hearing. So there is an item on your agenda after this for additional discussion and uh, potential consideration. So unless there's any questions, I will step away for the public. All right, so this public hearing has been noticed for consideration of proposed changes to Chapter 5 of the Municipal Code related to sidewalk usage. At this time, I'd like to open the public hearing uh, to take comments from members of the public. Please come up to the microphone. Well, sorry, for those on Zoom, we'll start in the room and then we'll move over. Hello, everybody. Hello, welcome. Please state your name and, and residence. 
Um, my name is Allie Nagel, and I live in Winooski, and I'm here as a resident and also on behalf of the Monkey House. Um, so I guess my first thought is um, where or why we're even having this change, and if there's been any formal complaints. To my knowledge, no formal complaints, but there's concerns about vehicle safety and, and liability issues. So if there's no formal complaints and it's been running for 17 years, or at least the monkey house has been, we don't know why anything has to change, especially if we're going towards more of a walkable and bikeable community, then why are we gonna make it harder for people to come into the city? Um, I know there's been some back and forth with the proposed change of like moving closer to the businesses, some of the seating, which doesn't, like that more inhibits the pedestrians walking, especially with doors opening, um, sandwich boards, all that stuff. So I just don't understand why it's even an issue if there's been no complaints. Um, so that's one. And then it also seems like this is happening really fast. The businesses were just made aware about this over the holiday season. And then um, already just coming to public comment today without being able to really talk or express you know, the concerns that people have, or at least getting it out to more of the community about it. Um, we feel, and like some other businesses that I've talked about, is that it's going to change the feel of the downtown. Um, we're still recovering from COVID, and Winooski's still not where it was pre-pandemic. So having limitations to the sidewalk or having to put money into new structures or new ways to make seating feasible just doesn't seem like the best situation for businesses. And a lot of businesses can't do that or invest into that. Um, and our success is then, you know, the city relies on our successes with that. Um, and most people still feel really, you know, there's still a bunch of people in this room with masks on. So they want to be outside. They want to be eating outside, drinking outside. Um, so it doesn't feel like it's the best step to then inhibit to be able to be outside comfortably. Um, so that was another thing. Let's see. I'm trying to think of what else. Yeah, we, I mean, just in general, we're really against this. Um, it's really only affecting four of the busiest restaurants downtown. Um, it seems like there's other solutions like curb, um, what are those like curb stalls or curb stops? I forget what they're called. They're like little cement things. If that's an issue of the, you know, the overhang um, or you put signage up. That also, you know, I've seen in different like areas where you could have a sign that says this is the correct way to park. This is not the correct way to park. Then you have that sign for to get a ticket. Um, and yeah, just overall, it just feels like it's against businesses. Um, and I'm just not sure where it, who it really directly benefits and just to have to keep the vibrancy of the downtown. And I think that's it. Let me see if I have any other notes. Yeah, and I guess the biggest one is if there hasn't been any formal complaints, um, I don't see why there needs to be a change. All right, thanks, Allie. Yes, thank you. Did you want to make a comment? Yeah. Please join us. I'm Maggie Barch, and I'm representing Our House Bistro. Um, uh, first, I wanted to um, express my appreciation for the city's work in trying to um, clarify sidewalk guidelines. I think it's um, uh, a useful thing for businesses to really have some clear guidelines to follow um, at, so that we know what we're doing. Um, so I wanted to uh, share that. And I also wanted to um, express my agreement with everything that Ali just said. Uh, those concerns are the same ones that we share at our house bistro. Um, and uh, the recovery is still ongoing as far as restaurants are concerned. And um, this is gonna be the first season where we might be back to some sort of normal business. We're all looking forward to that very much. Um, so I just wanted to share um, my thoughts on, on her comments as well. Um, one of the questions that I had were uh, was about the um, designation of a storefront um, and the use of 
seasonal space. Um, I understand that the city has added, if the building lot where an individual storefront is located is wider than the storefront, the business may request use of the sidewalk in front of the entire property. That will apply to us. Um, I'm wondering what criteria the city will use to make that determination. Um, and if there is an appeal process, if, um, you know, if the city decides that that doesn't go to the business owner. Um, part of that question too is, I know that in in the document it said specific deadlines for application submissions are outlined herein. I didn't see it. I looked pretty hard, but I think from listening to conversations about this before that um, sidewalk applications will be due with the liquor permit, maybe, which puts the deadline at different times for businesses, so that so that one business might be available to apply for sidewalk space before others. So I just wanted to see how that how that will be handled if that's fair um, to do. Um, let's see. Um, the minimum of five feet dedicated clear space or the two foot curb. Um, I wanted to point out just a few things um, to consider. Uh, this does um, impact five restaurants. Uh, who have all put um, some finances toward their um, outdoor, outdoor dining picnic tables. Um, so this would require replacement of the, that furniture, which is an expense to, to restaurants. Um, it's the reason that picnic tables are used is because we're on a hill. And picnic tables are levelable so that if you put a regular table in there, the person sitting downhill, the table comes up to about their chin, if you're my height, um, which is un uncomfortable. So um, picnic tables are a fantastic uh, solution for that because you can level a picnic table and the people that seat comes up as well. Um, it's uh, a good a good solution and I think it looks great. I think um, there are a bunch of uh, positives to being able to use that, and it's a detriment to have to replace those and get other tables that will not work on a hill so well. Um, I also wanted to mention that it looks like, from what I can tell, we're talking about um, our six-foot picnic tables being about six inches too long to accommodate the two-foot barrier and the five-foot walk space. It would be fantastic if the city would consider a four and a half foot sidewalk space or or the bumpers that Ali mentioned, because then we could all keep our six foot picnic tables and um, continue business. It just, it, for the matter of six inches, I think some flexibility would solve this um, dilemma for everybody. Um, if that isn't an option and we are replacing our picnic tables and we're going with something smaller, I will just use our, our situation as an example, we will lose about six seats, which we can turn over so many times in our business hours. Um, that comes to, for the season that we're allowed to have sidewalk space, um, underestimating quite a bit, a, a loss of about $15,000. Um, that's just for our small restaurant, we're smaller than the other, we have a smaller sidewalk space, um, considering that impact to all of the restaurants and to what um, benefit that our, our income helps the city out as well. I just would like you to take that into consideration because I think that's uh, just put dollars to it, so that it isn't just a small um, impact, it's, it's substantial. I um, think, oh, and the last one was, um, this wasn't a change, but I never noticed it before. The, um, uh, furniture that has to be uh, set out or brought in every night and every morning um, without prior approval. I don't remember that being part of the application before, so I just wanted to make sure that uh, I don't remember asking for that permission to leave our picnic tables out there. So if that's something that's going to be um, on the application, that that would be great if it's something we could just check if it's permanent. And I think that was it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Were you here for public for this public hearing on the sidewalk changes? No. No. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Let me move to our Zoom attendees then. Um, looks like Meredith has already moved over. So let's start with her. Hi guys. Um, thank oh, you can so we turn much, the volume, to every... please. Oh, 
Can you hear me? Yeah, sorry, Mary, but just a second. Meredith? Hi, I'm here. Um, okay. Thank, can you hear me now? Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to thank everyone for being here again. I know we've talked about this a lot and thank you to Allie and, and Maggie for coming in and um, giving their opinions. Um, I um, just wanted to say um, that I got a few uh, messages from folks um, that I'm just going to read anonymously. Um, they're from a variety of different businesses in the area. Some of them are um, directly impacted by these changes and some of them aren't. And I'll do my best to indicate which one's which. Um, so um, the first one is the additional information and context that was provided at the last meeting we had to discuss this, which was January 17th, seemed less intense than the initial outreach. Um, now it seems to only target a couple of businesses, but not sure it benefits anyone. So that was that comment. Um, and then the, uh, another comment that I received um, from someone who um, is a business owner, but doesn't have a business that um, is directly involved with this um, seating discussion um, was that the, for the safety and support of our vulnerable community, um, we should be encouraging outdoor seating as much as possible. Um, I think as maybe Ali mentioned, um, you know, there's, there's still a pandemic and um, we're still trying to figure out ways to serve the community, um, especially our most vulnerable members. Um, and um, having outdoor space is one of the ways that we can do that um, in our all too short summer months. That last part was me, not the business owner. Um, and um, then the next one was, um, this feels um, like it's an indication of continued negative feelings about the small business community by the city. It wasn't that long ago that there were lots of empty storefronts in Winooski. We are not big businesses. We're small and we're often living in Winooski too. We care about this community and we're a part of it. Um, and um, the other question, that was someone who I, I um, I didn't keep the notes. So I wanted to keep this anonymous. Um, I don't have a note about whether this was someone who's directly affected. And then uh, the last comment I have was, um, this doesn't directly impact our business, but this feels icky. Those are, that's a direct quote. Um, so those are the comments that I received. Um, I will say that in discussions with other people that I didn't um, get their um, opinions in writing, I have generally heard um, just a little bit of confusion um, about the the sort of what we've heard already, the sort of why now situation. Um, but in general, there also has been a couple of businesses that have said, yeah, we should be concerned with the safety of people sitting in those tables. That makes sense. Um, so there's definitely opinions across the board um, that I've definitely I've definitely heard. Um, and I think the general feeling um, that I got from people um, wasn't that this particular um, municipal code change was maybe um, you know, it, it doesn't affect that many businesses. It only, it seems like it's only affecting a few of them, um, but that it was sort of one of those things that just seems like an indicator um, of other things going on. So uh, people reading into the, the, the wording and people reading into kind of the, uh, the general vibe. Um, so uh, not quantifiable by any means, but just sort of, um, you know, feeling a bit like there's, um, an at odds feeling of, you know, small businesses in the community, um, especially those, um, you know, brick and mortar storefronts that like the one of the quotes said, uh, not too long ago, there was, uh, you know, no, no um, uh, support for economic vitality, and a lot of the storefronts were empty. And now we have actually the opposite problem where we don't have a lot of retail space. Um, and so the sort of just general concern about the the the, the feelings um, of the city, um, quote unquote, against uh, the small business community. So personally, I and I don't think the downtown Winooski board sees there to be a ton of uh, um, ad, um, like adversity going on, but there's just this general, very, you know, unease that's going on. And I think that this this council and the city, you know, and downtown Manuski is happy to be a partner in this, just kind of making sure that there's 
um, you know, positive communication and just sort of generally saying like, this is simply to do with safety and not to do with, you know, uh, an ongoing <laughs> uh, campaign against small businesses. And again, I, you know, we can't control um, how people will read into things, um, especially this, you know, small amount of businesses that are going to be directly and immediately affected. Um, but just kind of making sure that 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 the council is aware of the sort of murmurings that are happening um, and people definitely very much reading into this kind of action um, as to be a little bit, um, a little bit, um, I don't know what the word would be, um, nerve wracking to the small business community, especially at a time when there is still so much COVID recovery that's going on. And so many people are still kind of feeling, feeling those effects. Um, but I really appreciate all of your time. I know this has been brought up many times um, and I will leave it at that. Thank you, Meredith. Do we have other folks attending via Zoom who wish to make a comment? You can use the raise hand feature or the chat. Okay. So seeing no additional comments, I will close the hearing. Um, and now we have a chance for further discussion. Eric, do you want to come back up? Please. Sure. <clears throat> so I'll just start with a couple of the questions that came up. Um, the question about what would be the process for a business to request additional space if their storefront didn't fill their lot? Yeah, so that'll be outlined in the application. We're, we've developed a new application to go along with the changes that are proposed in this uh, in this um, section of the code so that it the two coincide. So there will be an opportunity in the new application to identify that additional space if, if it's being requested. And then is there an appeal process? I think we talked about this last time. Yeah, I think... I don't know if there's a formal appeal process written in, except for that uh, the initial applications would come to you all as the uh, as council slash liquor control board, and uh, as has as has happened in the past, when there's been a either a discrepancy or some confusion about what space has been allocated, the, yeah. the property owners have come back to you all uh, in your capacity to to address that issue. So I would presume that same scenario could be. Um, could be the, the process moving forward. Okay. And then, so would these applications be aligned to the liquor license, which now we see is not happening in bulk once a year? Right. So the way that the, the way that these regulations are written is that at least for the sidewalk use, um, the on page 12 of the draft, it says that any business that's seeking sidewalk use would uh, would need to request that use uh, at least 30 days in advance of the desired date of start. So that could come in with a liquor control application if they wanted to, and it would just it wouldn't take effect until the, the date of the sidewalk use, which is outlined from April 1 to November 30. Um, but they could come in anytime prior to that April 1 date, or I guess anytime knowing that the start is April 1, they could come in the, within 30 days of that date to, to make application. It would separate the two processes, but also I think the intent of the way we've laid out the new regulations is that we're also trying to separate the two review processes so that the initial process goes through council slash liquor control versus uh, future processes if there's no changes or no violations would be done administratively. So they'd be handled, they could potentially be handled at different times anyway. Okay. While we're on that topic, um, there's the three conditions that would allow for administrative approval, but the one that doesn't seem covered is if a business has previously requested the entire building frontage and only occupies a portion of it, and that building frontage then receives another business that might want to use sidewalk space. There's no, that isn't covered in those three conditions that would pick a application back to council. Um, so just as we kind of focused in on that um, question of allocating additional building frontage beyond the storefront. Um, we might need to have that. The three are, uh, it's been issued a violation. 
the area of the sidewalk use has not changed from the previous year and the ownership of the business has not changed from the previous year. Yeah, I think um, I think that would be covered under the area has not changed. So if they're if they are still proposing the same use of an adjacent uh, storefront, that would that would fall under that category. But if they were not, if they were no longer uh, proposing that, it would it would come back as a change of that of that space. I guess I'm thinking more. There's a business. They've got this store, this part of the building, and there's part of the building's empty. This owner requests the entire frontage. Right. I open my restaurant here, and I want to get sidewalk. This this is administratively approvable because nothing is changing. But I would not be able to then request the same space of sidewalk usage. Right, business A, right, the existing business hasn't changed the area. They haven't changed the ownership, and they haven't violated the code, so they don't. They go to administrative approval, and it doesn't come to council. I guess I may not be fully understanding your question. Am I, is, am I making sense? Yeah. So, you know, we gave Papa Frank's a bunch of extra sidewalk space during the pandemic because it wasn't being used. Right. If they came back this year and wanted that, you could approve it. But then some other business, actually, another restaurant actually opens next door and now like their sidewalk access is gone. Right. How do we avoid that happening? Well, so the, you mean, how does that new business? Yeah, get how, the how are they going to get their, their so, storefront? Right, so annually the, the adjacent business would need to sign off on, or the, the building owner or business owner would need to sign off on giving up that space. So if a new business came into that, to that now vacant space, that that business owner or the building owner would need to sign off on allocating the sidewalk in front of their business to the adjacent business. Okay. Which I I would think would be would constitute a change of their application because it's new space or it's different space than was previously approved. So that would need to come back before before you all. So just carrying us through the scenario. So essentially, um, so if business B comes in after the administrative approval, would the administrative approval then carry forward through the end of the season unless the business B said, actually, I want that storefront space? I would say if it's already been approved, yes. Okay. That would carry forward because we would have the sign offs from from the property owner saying that that sidewalk space can go to another business. So if they then lease that site that that business space, that would have to be it would should be known anyway that the sidewalk use is not available for the for that particular season. Is there a complication there with a business owner versus a building owner? The, I believe it's spelled out that the property owner would need to to sign off on that. Okay. So that whoever whoever owns the building would need to be the one signing off. If the business owner and the and the property owner are the same person, then that's that's covered. But I believe it's it's designated that the the property owner needs to sign off on allocating the additional space. Okay. What if the building owner and the business owner are at odds for some reason? <laughs> And the building owner signs off on something that the business owner wouldn't wouldn't agree to or wouldn't like. Then I think that would be a, a matter between the business owner and the and the property owner and not anything for the city to get involved with personally. Yeah, I feel like it should almost maybe not that scenario, but the first scenario be flipped and that we would be allowing somebody to use the space next to them provisionally and then if a business were to come in like you're leasing the space from the business that isn't there yet if a business were to come in like that is their space i just feel like in term, i don't really know if we have like a ton of open storefronts anyway sure but like in terms of business attraction if you're going to open up if you wanted to open a business i feel like if you knew you were you didn't have outside space for the remainder of the year you may not be interested in leasing that space anymore sure and then that puts the not the burden but the decision on the business owner who's existing in that space if they want to expand knowing that there's a possibility somebody could come in that's up to them and that's their finances if they have to buy more tables etc 
I think it's on the property owner. Like if they're really trying to lease this space to someone who might want sidewalk access, then they shouldn't sign off. Because the flip side is if it's like provisional, I got permission to use this space. I staffed and budgeted around it and then so, and then it gets revoked halfway through the summer. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, I mean, I, I do think that's part of doing business though. Like you could take that risk and take this space, but I don't think we should limit it from somebody else from wanting to move in there. <clears throat> I, I think, Councillor, I think that is covered because it's an annual application. So it would only be good for that April to November timeframe, and then they'd have to apply again the next year. Yeah. If the application is the same and the space is still available, they would still need that sign off each year. The sign offs wouldn't be automatic. That would have to be done every year because that's not technically part of the space that's in front of their storefront. So it may be that a business, if it come, if a business, if there's an empty storefront and a business moves in partway through the season, they may not have access to that sidewalk space for the remainder of that part of the year. But the following season, they would potentially have access. So, I guess that's a building manager choice to choose. Yeah, to I mean, that I, space for a season, knowing that they might have a lessee that then is disadvantaged for those right. Is that a competitive disadvantage for them? They get to make that choice. Yeah, I think, like, to Aurora's point, like, you're taking it away from the person actually making the money from using the outdoor space. But it is up to the, if it's up to the building owner, then. Well, they may have not, they may have trouble filling their space in the yeah no I think they, they make that choice to really probably question. would yeah. this doesn't expressly prevent prevents the wrong word prohibit picnic tables right it does not no no Maggie can I ask could you shave yours down by six inches yeah you can short um shaking it down and we still wouldn't be able to fit as many people at it who brings a seat yeah two seats. two seats so our picnic tables can be up there if you might be able to shave yeah. we usually think so so if we shave them down it would be going for and that would also six seats that we turn over from the between you know three and eight times a day especially at night um so exponentially that just that uh it doesn't seem to help, but it is it is a thing change. If we should mention that we don't have that kind of thing, because if we could all be a little flexible about the amount of sidewalk space would occur, we could just continue this thing. Well then the cost of shaving that down. It's not as easy as it sounds. So oh, then if they think it's wrong and you do one center here, then you can shave it down again and somebody that's skilled enough to shave it down and sand it or paint it, you know, there's a lot of labor and cost that goes into it. Uh, just to also point out that picnic tables are four to eight hundred dollars each. Uh, um, they're not they're not just the you know very happy with them. It's a bit of a business. And I think the follow-up question then, Eric, is the six inch and six inch discrepancy. If we wanted to accommodate that, it would be reducing the like overhang space, right? That or the the clear space for the for the walkway. Yeah, and I guess kind of planning out some of that idea. How would I guess thinking about ADA accessibility um, and having flexibility around that amount of space? Because I think that's that's one of the concerns that would come up is. Um, businesses who um, haven't left enough clearance for ADA accessibility. Yeah, and I think as we've talked at previous meetings that, you know, ADA is the minimum is three feet, but because of the, the nature of the downtown core, the minimum that we're comfortable with is that five foot clearance. I don't know what constitutes a formal complaint, but we did have some concerns from patrons this past year regarding clearance and table placement and light poles. So it, it did come up this past season. I think that's, yeah, that's true on the walkway side. Yeah. 
I think it's like the the parking. My impression, anyhow, is that like the parking, the concerns about parking in, impediments hasn't been like a formal. Okay. Yeah. yeah, no parking. So I think so. Yeah, I know we did receive some complaints about use of the, uh, in particular, of, of the bike rack on the southern end of the of the of Main Street there at the intersection of uh, West Canal Street and Main Street that the tables were so close that bike rack was virtually unusable. So we. We did have to deal with some some issues like that, um, but so we we have received some complaints, not necessarily related to some of the changes that are built in here. But as we've discussed at previous meetings, we're really focusing on safety and, and kind of the liability that the city is is taking on by allowing use of of the city property for for this purpose. Um, I'm thinking about so some of the just returning to previous conversations is you were talking about like leasing space but is that leasing city space well i think i just used the term leasing just to visualize what it was saying okay yeah. <laughs> all right just checking on that um eric maggie had brought up um moving furniture in and out but i noticed on the document it's all that portion is actually scratched out so i wasn't sure if that continues to be included or not included is there a page reference uh, sorry yeah page seven H7. Yeah, so actually this language was was stricken because it's covered uh, further back in the in the new language. Um, we're basically not uh, we're, we're including similar language that it's you know the area needs to be um, uh, needs to be kept clear and and maintained and and etc. Sorry, I'm just reading through what's actually stricken here. Okay. I, I don't know that we carried the specific hours of, of setup. I, I think we we did eliminate that to allow the businesses to keep tables outside as as they needed to, um, packing them up again as they as they may for security reasons or to to lock them up. But I don't believe we put any any. Uh, parameters on when they could actually have tables set up in that space. I think it is still there on page 14 and item E. It says furniture will not be set up more than one hour before approved opening times. Okay, so that was existing language yeah. though as well. So it was stricken from one spot, but not that second. But you didn't mean to strike it from both sides. I believe we did. I think that was the intent there is to to not limit um, the setup of, of furniture. And I don't know if uh, I believe John Rauscher is also on potentially listening in on Zoom. Uh, if I don't know if John, if you had any thoughts on that or any comments since you're maintaining that sidewalk space. Yeah, or the sorry. I was I was half listening. <laughs> the the language related to setup of uh, of furniture in the sidewalk space it was stricken from one section but left in another. I think the intent was to to strike that from both sections so that the tables could just stay out if they if they needed to during the sidewalk season. Yeah, that was my understanding too. Yeah. So I have some sympathy for the timeline here for businesses to accommodate this, like having heard about it over the holidays, having invested in stuff over the last two years to address pandemic. If we didn't implement this for April 1st, but we pursued it for like next year, what is the impact to, I don't know, what does that do to your process as staff? Uh, that's a good question. I think it depends on if we're if we're pausing the entire uh, the entire change, uh, including some of the liability insurance and things that we've talked about at past meetings that we're we're looking for. Uh, that may be something we can just include on an application. I don't know how. I'm not sure that we can require it if it's not in a in the code somehow. But um, I, I think the biggest thing is it's it's a, an additional year of potential of uh, potential liability that the city's carrying. And if that's a risk you all are, are comfortable taking, and I'll—I'm not sure, Elaine, if you want to weigh in on anything as well in that regard. 
Yeah, I would just underline that and yeah, I, I understand the the that it might feel sudden, even though it feels like a long time to us, you know, in terms of planning for restaurants, I can see how it feels more sudden. And yeah, that would be those are the extent of the impacts really. And while we still have John here, would you consider reducing the the parking overhang requirement any further? Uh, is if for a final sort of um, if you're asking to reduce it from two feet, I would not recommend doing that because that is sort of design overhang width. Um, any less than that, then you're you still have that sort of risk. Um, if somebody does get hit there and injured, you've sort of already been told at this point, unfortunately, that two feet is is the recommended clearance space. Right, and you'll recall that the the um, city's insurer they recommended that whatever it is, it follows some sort of standard, and yeah. we have with the two feet. That's the the best protection we have against the suit. Um, succeeding against the city if there was an injury. Is there a way to move forward with the liability insurance portion, but pushing back the changes for a year? I don't know that, that we would need council approval for that piece. I'll have to look into it. Oh, another thought that might not be possible considering what type of document this is, um, is if it, would there be a way to do like an incremental change to make it like be in compliance over the course of like, this is going into effect, you will need to be in compliance by like three seasons from now, two seasons from now. Um, on, I think maybe the thing I'm thinking most about is like the tables maybe being say six inches more than we're asking. I'm not sure that quite, quite makes sense with that. Yeah, I think it, it just comes down to what Eric had said or, already. So it, it's that much longer that council is stating that you're comfortable with the liability risk. So <laughs> I mean, our this is our recommendation as staff that the city has been under this risk for some time, and it's just lucky that, and there have been accidents that we've heard about, but nobody complained about them. Nobody sued the city for them. Uh, but if if at some point somebody does, then, and it's not, just, just to be fair, it's not that the city would be liable for the full amount. We would have a deductible that we would be liable for. But it could potentially affect our um, experience modification from in terms of like a premium cost might, would might go up in the next year after such a suit. So there would be some cost to the city. I guess my one thing I'm wondering is if there is a way to bump parking back six feet. And I know we talked about Jersey Bears being unworkable, but I'm wondering if there's any way to do a wheel stop that is six inches back from the curb, back from where it is now. Because right, the wheel stops at the curb and that creates a two-inch array and can you drop one of those parking barrier, like the eight-inch high ones on there in the summer permanently, still have the snow management, which I know is the issue of permanent barriers. Um, and do we have some ability, at least in this one corridor where this is creating the most adverse impacts to have an option to reduce the parking stall depth in favor of maintaining that five feet and the ex additional six inches. Are there issues on either end? John, do you wanna comment on that? Yeah, sure. So we did we did review that kind of as one of the first options to look to see if there's anything we could do sort of inexpensively to change the geometry and, and accommodate sidewalk use. Um, unfortunately, the the way the geometry of the parking is set up now is sort of the recommended layout minimum distances. We did look at, did they even make a durable temporary wheel stop that we could, you know, try to use? And 
we couldn't find a, a manufacturer that that made sense. And given that VTrans just did a whole um, concrete project resurfacing, we didn't really want to look at you know punching holes in the new <laughs> in the new resurfaced concrete either. So there there's some maintenance issues there. Um, but that was something we looked at and we just could not find a solution that really worked with the existing parking geometry and just the temporary nature of it. And John, wouldn't six inches encroach on an already narrow uh, quarter on the backside? Uh, on the on the parking stall depth, is that? Uh, sorry, right. So the, the, um, the traffic lane behind the parking? Yeah, it's already, I mean, it's less than what the fire department would want currently. Um, so it's, it's uh, I forget what the dimension is, but it's, um, I think it's like 12 or, yeah, I, I forget offhand, but it would reduce that, that, that drive lane even more, which is not really in compliance with what the fire department would, would want to see there. Um. So right now we are just looking at maintaining the walkway at an ADA depth of um, required depth of three feet. Is that right? Well, we're not in this. Oh, so sorry. Right now, now, I believe that's correct. John, did you catch that question? I can say it again. Yeah, five feet is is what I think is currently the minimum. Um, three feet is the absolute. ADA minimum, um, but honestly, in a downtown area like that, seven to eight feet is is what's recommended for just the amount of traffic that's pedestrian traffic that that's down there. And so, John, can you give us a sense for current conditions? Uh, I wish I had the sketches in front of me. Hold on. <laughs> yeah, I. I think the, I don't know if you remember offhand, Eric, I believe the the paver section is seven to eight foot wide. The I think that's right. I was going to say the, the brick area on the on the upper side in front of the storefronts is seven, I think six in some spots, six to eight feet wide through there. And then the large granite kind of streetscape belt that um, where there's a step down, it's it's five foot wide, and then the curbing is an additional six inches wide. For both the actual curb at the street and the, the step as yeah. well. So, yeah. so in some spots, it's an additional foot of curbing, and in others, without the step, it's just the, the curb at the road of six inches. Yeah, I think what's rough um, for me is I feel like I left the last time we spoke about this thinking it was going to provide more benefits for businesses and then to hear like actual dollar amounts calculated by one business and then you multiply that by the others that it's affected by just a lot of revenue loss given the difficulty we had in the budget I really don't like the idea of revenue loss um it's just uh yeah, I wish there was a different way we could fix both problems. Yeah, because we also don't want to incur the liability, sounds like. That could change. And I think, Council Renner, to your to your point, I think it's this is these changes will impact each business differently, for sure. I mean, I've had conversations with at least one business owner that said this will have no impact on my business whatsoever. I'll be able to accommodate all the tables I currently have in the same footprint uh, that I'm using now, just shifting it in and I'll be fine. So I think it's going to depend on the specific location as well as, as uh, you know, what, what the expectations or what the current conditions of the business are. So it, it will be variable. That's, I guess, is probably the, the easiest way to put that. Yeah. I'd be open to advancing these to start next year. These changes. Twenty twenty four. Yeah. <laughs> the only other things we haven't talked about is whether to extend or exempt or exclude one section of the city from these regulations, thus minimize or minimizing most of the risk, but not completely eliminating it. Um, so you know, risk spread over the entire city is different than risk in one block. 
And then the other one would be any sort of um, request for ex um, an exemption um, that council can make on a case-by-case -case basis if they decided to take on risk business by business um, to forgo these rules. Those are two options I don't think that we've discussed previously. Um, which I think I, I agree that implementing this now, all of this now seems a little bit too soon. Um, that could be something to consider between now and the year start date, the year out start date. I imagine you'd want to talk to our insurer to understand if that we're exempting a section, knowing that there's less space than. Or even just exempting, like making a rule you could request up only a foot and a half overhang instead of a two foot overhang yeah. as, a, as a part of your application. We would be not in compliance with standards. So it would be less defensible in a suit. But is it more defensible than having nothing? Yeah. I guess that was what I heard in your question. Yeah. Uh, when what's the nothing? When's the nothing? Uh, just leaving things as they are. Ah. So right now we have a hundred percent risk. <laughs> yeah. With these standards, maybe we have zero percent. Would exemptions give us ninety-five percent? Yeah. Or oh, sorry, five percent risk. Ninety-five yeah. percent coverage. <laughs> Uh, that seems unlikely, but if you want me to ask, I will ask. I mean, where does it end, you know? Well, I think that 100 feet of risk is a lot different than 20,000 feet of risk, whatever the total Main Street corridor plus all of their sidewalks around the rotary. Like, there's there's a difference between your probability of injury and a reduced linear footprint. I don't know if insurers and underwriters think about it that way, but it certainly is different. I don't know if I would look at the risk that way. It's more like if something happened, then what? what's the exposure to the city for that one event? I, I know what you're saying. Like, what's the likelihood of it happening anywhere? Yeah. It, I'd say for me, I just don't understand what the basis of the exemption are is really from a policy level standpoint. That part I would that would take some thought and I have some concerns about. I think um, for me in the in like the immediate future, I think it would be good to advance the two million insurance coverage requirement. If we're not going to move anything else, I would advocate that we move that forward. Yeah, I'll check. And uh, I misspoke earlier. I said without council approval, but yes, without code change was the actual concern. So I'll look into that. Whether we can just go ahead with that without a code change. Okay. I feel like I've asked this question before, but forgive me if it was the past I've been. Is there no way where the liability of the overhang can be put on to the business and then if they want to over use more room or not use more room that's on them and no longer on the city there's no way to avoid absolute liability because it they what happens in a lawsuit is they're suing whoever they want to sue and how defensible each um what's the opposite of the plaintiff Defendant. Defendants. <laughs> it's up to, it, the at that point, then the defendant either has a strong case to make or not. And we can't enter like a legal agreement with the businesses that they have sued, assume that defense. I don't know. I guess I could we could look into that. Um then there would be a basis for the exemption, right? Because if you remove all the risk from the city right, and that's... the business entirely is responsible willing to take it on. So I don't know if they it, all are. I know I've spoken with some and they would be willing to. I don't know if everyone would, but our concern there was if the city, their concern is making money, but I feel like if we 
doing what we need to do takes away what they they want to do. But if there's a way to get us to be partners on it instead, maybe that will. Yeah, I, I do. At some point, I I don't know if we could ever. I'll look into it. My and I'm not an attorney, but I do wonder at some point what how airtight that would be because in any such lawsuit a good lawyer for the plaintiff is going to go after the deepest pocket to ensure the best outcome for their for their client. The city is going to have a deeper pocket than the business owner. So, but I don't know the answer definitively to your question. It's not an apples to apples comparison, but a lot of ski resorts lease land from the state. There's a significant amount of liability there. And injuries happen all the time on ski resorts. So I wonder how the state protects themselves from liability. I'm betting that there's some waiver that the skiers are entering into an agreement for their own liability. So in which case we don't have that situation. Like not every customer coming into downtown is signing a, wa a waiver. Right. I guess for well, my questions with putting it off the year, does that truly, I guess, would that be better for businesses or is it still going to be hard for businesses while also putting the city at risk? It's a good question. I know, Allie or Maggie, you wanna, would a one year delay make you, would that accommodate somewhat? I think it accommodates somewhat, I think. Real, like in reality, we don't want it to happen at all. Yeah. Um, but maybe there's more creative things that could occur in that next year as well. And I, you know, the idea of businesses taking that liability, I mean, that um, we would have to see what that means, but we already take a lot of liability already with liquor liability insurance. So, like, it might already be covered somewhere in there. <laughs> and if that's the direction council wants to go um at some point even if we did have hopefully there doesn't happen but if there was a crash in the next year and then we had that jump in premium then you would have the protection going forward and so it wouldn't be forever i'm sorry can you repeat that so if if you if council adopted the change in FY in for season 2025, that means that whatever happen happens next year, that risk like you'd have a jump in premium if there was a crash in 2023, right? But assuming that after 2024 you don't have that risk anymore, eventually that premium impact would go away. Oh, okay. Because you wouldn't keep it experiencing more and more crashes. Well, I think we have three options here. Elaine, check me on this. Someone could move this forward as is. Um, we could move it forward for adoption in 2024. Well, you could, or would we? We would just wait and bring this back because we have some questions to still surface. What would happen if this council adopted effective 2024? I guess the it would be a little odd because the ordinance change wouldn't be an effect then. Or could we build on in the long change? I haven't seen one just like that. Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure the, the logistics of how that would work or the legality of it okay. because it is an ordinance. Uh, it is a change to the code, which does have an effective date once it's approved. So I don't know if that can be delayed just by action of, of council saying that it's not gonna become effective until a later date. I think statute outlines when changes to code become effective. So I don't know that you can extend those, but I I don't know. I don't have a good answer for that. Okay. So then our choices are we could move this forward now or we could not, and we could bring it back for future review with some more information. We have the intent to do it in that scenario. I'm saying we have the intent to make it effective in 2024. The council could end up not doing it or changing it. You know, there's that risk as well. Is there a third option of 
making amendments or would that need to go to go back out for public hearing? I think it would have to go to the public hearing again, right? If you're looking at making changes that are substantively different than what's in here now, it would need to go back through public hearing, yes. And there's th a third option is to, well, along the lines of amendments, everything but the actual two foot, five foot, the sidewalk area designation could be put through, like everything, all the other changes that you have outlined could be included except for that stupid overhang in terms of making that providing the other benefits that these changes would have for the city and for the process but just eliminating that one definition of clear space so that would be I would still have, that's a substantive change so it'd have to be an expedient public hearing but that's something that could be considered that's true so I think if the Proposal, yeah, I believe that probably would be, even though it's the language is not currently included. We're not; those would be removing potential ads. So I don't know if those would be considered substantive changes because it's substantive for what's proposed, but based on what's currently in place, hmm. it may not be substantive. So I don't know that we would. I would probably feel more comfortable with a legal opinion on on that <laughs> question. But my initial thought is that. Because it's not currently in place, we're just striking the language instead of because it's not added yet. So it may not technically but be a substantive change. Hmm. But I do not want to give you that as advice currently. I have another question, and this might not be one that anyone can necessarily answer, but I want to put out does making this change like taking the money from both the city and the businesses out of it is making this change going to make visitors and residents in Winooski safer like are we putting off something that would make Winooski safer or are we putting off something that is it's purely fiscal it will make visitors safer And I think that it it will make the liability safer. I don't know that it would prevent any accidents. I don't think it would keep anyone from harm, but it would it would be better. So that, I'm not sure if that was what you know your question, but it won't keep people safer, but it will keep it will protect the environment if that makes sense. I don't think it's on the question. I mean, I think the we're dealing with a hypothetical. Like it's it hasn't been seen. Like a two foot buffer certainly seems like it's the standard, but somebody could drive up onto the sidewalk. I mean, when you see like bad crashes, like it's usually somebody like driving into a building. So like a two foot buffer doesn't prevent that anyway. But like, so like I don't think you can answer that question. Like we're talking hypothetics, it, like hypothetical ideas here well the reason for the standard is because it is safer so i'm saying that the standards are telling us this will be safer for people it's going to be much harder to have someone have their leg crushed between a bench and a car bumper if these are put in place yeah that's correct. that that is almost impossible to happen unless something is set up not according to this code and then so i think that i would say that is unequivocally true whether or not it'll happen Correct. It's a question. Right, which I, I think that was Maggie's point. Yeah. It doesn't mean it, it will happen if we don't do this. It just means that the risk of it happening will be much less. Yeah. So I think we're back to two choices here. Someone could move, so could make a motion to approve this as is, or no one could do that. We bring this back at a future meeting, which is gonna be in a month because it won't go on our first March meeting. Yeah, no, I mean like, I asked Elaine the question and she, she was going to ask the lawyer. So yeah. I don't feel comfortable moving anything forward until she's had time to do that. And I've been taking notes too, Elaine. And in a month, we're still not in outdoor seating season, so nobody will be sitting outside. It could be. I don't <laughs> think technically people can put their stuff out until April. <laughs> I don't think our current regulations specify the time. Uh, well, I may be wrong on that. <laughs> In that case, they missed out on those really warm days. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, I'm gonna just do one last call for motion. I'll move. Does anyone want a second? Okay, we will revisit this. Thank you for coming in. Thank you. And thank you, Zim attendees. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Almost there. Yeah, just okay. <laughs> Don't go away. Okay. Uh, DRB appointment. Yes, thank you very much. Um, here tonight to request appointment of Emily Morse to the position of alternate on the development review board with a term ending June 30 of 2024. Um, we we were a uh, the, the development review board has a, a seven member has seven members appointed uh, five regular members two alternates we recently had one of our alternates step down um, Caitlin Hayes she moved out of the city so she stepped down from the DRB as not being a resident anymore fortunately we were lucky to have uh, Ms. Morse um, submit an application for for the position of, of alternate basically to fill that the remainder of of Caitlin's term um, Emily comes to the to the to the board with as a design manager for Lewis Creek Builders, uh, which provides a I think a a good depth and breadth of of knowledge with building activity and basically the same the same information that the that the development review board uh, is tasked with with uh, with overseeing. The chair of the development review board and myself did interview with with Miss Morse uh, previously. We both are recommending that she be appointed for uh, for this position. And I'm not sure if she's with us tonight or not. But I believe she's on Zoom. Emily, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, yes, thank you. Um, I don't really have a whole lot to say. I thought the interview was really interesting and went really well, and I'm excited for this opportunity. Um, <laughs> I started my college career as an economic development major and then couldn't stop drawing houses and thinking about houses. So I think this is a very cool opportunity to merge kind of both of my interests. Awesome. You look very qualified. Sounds like it too. Um, thank you for your interest in, in serving in this role. Are there any questions? I'm just going to uh, identify a potential perceived conflict of interest as we are in a contract with Lewis Creek Builders, and Emily in particular is a very good at drawing pictures mm -hmm. of houses, uh, ours included. Um, so I do want to disclose that potential or perceived conflict of interest. Um, and I, looking at our policy, I can entertain any questions that folks have it, but we already have issued, received our zoning permit and are under active construction. So there's no we're not, gonna have, we're not going to be going through the development review board That's correct. Uh, for this particular project. Um, so I'll disclose that. I don't think that I need to recuse myself because I think we can still act fairly impartially in the public interest in this matter, but I didn't want to let the folks know. And Wynn seems very qualified, so I think you're, you're good. She's good. <laughs> okay. okay. Motion to approve this appointment. So moved. Second. Motion by Bryn, second by Thomas. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, Emily. Thank you so much. Thank you all very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. We've lost Mr. Frega for our next item. Let me do our, let me, let me just do a five minute recess. Uh, it's 720, we'll reconvene at 725 and we will hear the Pine Grove Terrace <clears throat> request. Patient request. Elaine is gonna give an introduction and then pass it to the residents. Thank you. So as you know, representatives from the Pine Grove Terrace Homeowners Association have been in discussions with staff regarding their sewer pump station and the associated dispart charge pipe, the other way is known as the Fort's main. Uh, their requests include the city taking over the facility or to reimburse them for repair they claim was required by city work in the area. <coughs> Excuse me. After discussing with staff and the city attorney, I have denied both requests. The HOA has essentially requested council hear their appeal of my decisions. Uh, now reading from the memo, a city council can serve this function of hearing appeals of city manager decisions. A staff does recommend in this case that council decline to take action, thereby deferring to the city manager's decisions in this case. A city council does not have the technical or legal information to make such determinations. And the community is better served by relying on its professional staff and contracted services in such cases. 
Um, it is also not exactly council's role to make this sort of uh, detailed determination on a specific situation. As mentioned in the memo from the public works director, if council does wish to take up this, this type of matter, it would be more appropriate to do so at a policy level. In this case, following past practice, that would take the form of directing staff out of the annual policy priorities and strategies process, uh, directing staff to explore impacts of the city taking over private sewer pump stations in the city, of which there are eight. All right, thank you. Would you like to start, Thomas? Well, I'm Tom Frog. I'm from the Pine Hill Affairs. I have my vice president and treasurer. You can introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Levi. I'm vice president of the HOA. Hey, I'm Andrew Garamy, and I'm the treasurer. And without them, I probably would be. All right, so to start off with a pun, after what the city manager just presented to you, I'm starting in the sewer hole. I'm trying to work my way out. There is a lot to do with this, and there's a lot of history to this. But I think the problem is, is that we're not against what the city just said they might have to do. What we're just saying is, after hearing your budget hearings, this is a no cost item to you. We're willing to pay our own way. We're willing to do what we've done in the last few months, pay $750 each residence, 22 residents, a special fee to upgrade the pump system. We just did that. We paid over $21,000 in the uh, upgrade of that pump station. The bills are which are, I believe, in that packet. We did what the city proposed if they were going to take it over six months ago. One of the guidelines is we'd have to meet higher standards. But we brought in a um, private contractor, someone the city recognized and respected, and they did look over the site. It cost us $800 just to do an assessment. They replaced the pump, but they replaced the infrastructure in that sewer system. And they put a new lid on it. Which was clearly needed it was very dangerous. I'll show you some pictures of that. Having done that, and they, clearly the global association behind that, I also recognize from the city in the last six months, we got numerous emails that they have communicated with various presidents and various members go back and forth and took over the watershed. We've been saying to that for 30 years since I've been here. That we can't take that exploration. We could never afford to fix that portion. And the specifications from um, the uh, federal and state, we really wouldn't give them any guidelines. What if we hired a contractor and paid $20,000 and then somebody said that doesn't meet the standards because they changed? So we just didn't do it. We fought back. We said, give us the standards. At least we know what we're going to do with it. The city went through several city managers. Meantime, we kept communicating. We cleared trees and brush out of there, but we really just couldn't come to what I'm saying. It wasn't until the city said, We found a way. The city came to us and said, We got a grant, 50 50, whatever it was, and they could do it. All they needed for us to sign off the memo. We had a permit that had been outdated. They wanted to fix that. They had all the expertise, all the knowledge, all the understanding. Couldn't have been happening. Are we going to pay taxes for that at some point? Well, we're eight thousand dollars on an average, twenty-two homes up there, paying taxes for the last thirty years. I mean, we're we're paying considerable. We're considered a, a pioneer, but we got a pump station. Any of you have pump stations in your neighborhoods? I believe so. Well, it's a big issue. So we've been dealing with that as membership. And quite frankly, we haven't done a good job because we're changing staff. COVID, we had like one person going to continue trial and didn't even collect dues for most of the part the last two years. When I took over, nobody wanted my position. I walked into it. <clears throat> I didn't have to campaign or anything for it. Luckily, I was able to get Levi to stay with me. And um, Andrew stepped up and said, I'll help you out. And the secretary came on board. So because of that, I said, okay, we'll collect all the dues, four years of worth in some cases, and we'll get moving, we'll get our fund back, and we'll do what we gotta do. Meantime, I drive down the road and I find a hole in the pavement in, in the street. That hole had an odor coming from it, and I said, oh my goodness, 
I better call the city. I called the city, the police department, so on a weekend. And he said, We got this. We'll let somebody know. So, unbeknownst to me, a neighbor comes to me a day later and says, Did you see this one? I said, Yeah. He said, well, I called him on Friday. I said, Okay, great. I did too, Saturday. Well, nobody's been up here. Well, at least they know. On Monday, I run into public utilities. And he says, how come you haven't done anything about this? He says, why would I do anything about it? It's under a street. So right away, no, you're responsible for the pipe all the way up to the hill. That's news to me. 30 years here, I only thought it was responsible pump station. Well, how do I have the authority to hire somebody to contract me, take this hole up? Well, I'll help you with that. Okay. Got a lot of support. You got a contractor. You got someone in. But I said, I really want to do this. In disagreement that we own, I'll pay for it. I know we got concerns for EPA, we got spillage. Let's get this done and let's do the right thing. And we went ahead and did that. And I think the total bill we submitted to the city, so they know I have it here copies of what we paid. After doing that, we probably met with the city manager and eventually had time. We know the city manager came on, we gave her time to get. Used to the job or be available. We met quickly, very positive conversation. Said, Well, let's see what the deed says. We asked the city clerk for support. We got in there, and all we could find was that we were responsible for the pump station according to the deed. We didn't find any easements or anything like that. There was an exception where we asked our local attorney who one of the homeowners to show if there were any exceptions. There were none. So we thought we had a pretty good case. We've been trying to communicate, a lot of stuff going on for the city, as we can see. But we finally, late in the fall, got further communication, and then the email started going back. Documentation, easements, maps, who owns what. Very surprised to see some of this thing. But also very surprised to see we have such a huge liability in front of those pipes. I took some pictures, trying to look at the easement for the map, and realized that that goes up to a residence. This is us down here. That goes up to a residence, to a residence that now has a house that wasn't there when we first moved in, and has a garage. I don't know if that's on top of our easement or what land. Oh, who controls that? If we were supposed to, he made them go up above him and said, You can't build there. I don't know. I don't know if the city over, overlooked it for us. I said, you can't do that. Or what? But all I know is we're not really sure, even though that shows a line. This shows a line coming up on this side. The easements are for two residents on this side, saying off the, off the curb. I'm not an expert. I'm not here to try to present myself as an expert. I'm trying to say that the city has clearly showed and several times that they know a lot more about this than we do. They really ex express that. They also are much more organized than we do. They clearly express that. And all the documentation they've given us, they show them that. I have a pile of it. As far as the homeowners say, they say presidents, you look at this list, the school's listed on it. The school's got their base. They got, they got, these, uh, these are the other eight private okay. pump stations. Yes, thank you. The housing authorities, you know? I mean, there might be a couple here that actually are personal associations. But then again, do they have a pipe that goes up 500 feet up a hill, up a road? Or are they just 10 feet away from the sewer? I know for a fact that where our easement is, they, they have a personal pump station. They have a personal pump station right here on that on that lot just by themselves. Why? Because we weren't sure of the capacity of ours. And then when they came in and said about themselves, they want to do a one-time payment. We said, no, you got a joint association. If you choose, so the city required to do a pump station. We also have a couple of fields at the beginning of the street. Right next to the quarry and across the street, owned by the quarry, is open field. They came to us early on 30 years ago and said, Can we tie into your pump station? 
or a package when they could have taken it over. But at the time, we weren't sure of the capacity, we weren't sure how it could be. So we lost that housing ability or that space for the city to earn taxpayer money off residential. If the city had control of that, maybe that would be different. It makes sense to me common, in a common sense way. The argument we brought to the city that started all this discussion, and I'm not saying it wasn't the first time. We've had these talks before. We, we felt the city really should take the lead on this. When I looked at the pipe, when the contractors were they were doing a great job, I was glad the city gave me up. There is a bend in that pipe. Oh, let me show you how I'm this thing. I brought this. My daughter made me buy this little thing. I'm going to use it, right? So, if you look closely, you see a bend in the pipe. Now, I used to be a helicopter crew chief. I know a little about maintenance. I know a little about stress fractures. I'm not an engineer, and I'm not going to over, over speak to city officials. But I would tell you that it's hard to get a, a leaf from with a bend. Why did the bend come there? Well, there was a huge amount of construction in that area. And I'll show you quickly if you can bear with me. Starting that far back from the end of the road. Everybody can see it okay? You see the line where it starts? It goes down and the sewer pump is here, down here at the end, off the road. The line goes out and it's water hit. The only thing I understood, you know, retired, so I'm home a lot, I see the guys, was that we need to be clear of the road so the trucks could get down here, big trucks. Trucks brought on back, back to trucks. Big trucks. He did a lot of digging. They removed a lot of dirt. They had to. This back here, well area, had to be all dug out. So they moved a lot of dirt, brought a lot of dirt in. Very scientific. I talked to the engineer, very new technology, very high end. Special kind of grass was put in there. Uh, pipes were coming in from Colchester and everywhere. They had to deal with that. Yeah, they did a great job. But I didn't know there was a pipe under there well, that I have to be concerned about. And then uh, I show you the his garage uh, going up to the site, going up the hill. I don't know where the pipe is. Is it in front of the garage? Is it underneath the garage? Is it behind it? I don't know. When I told him there was a garage, I said, There's no garage. Take a picture. Okay, so I did. So I don't know. This discussion. This is the new pumps, the new equipment we put in. This is how it looked before. Now, get alarm went off nine o'clock one night. I had to go down there with a flashlight and look in that hole and see what the heck's going on. I had no clue. No clue. So I called the uh, company, just like the city would today. We may be paying for that. The city would do today. Somebody would come and take a look at it and say, you know what? Your floats fell, fell into the pump. But we couldn't get somebody for, for three days. Now we have a contract with somebody to come that night and check us. But because we are working with the city, we upgraded to a monitoring alarm where we get on our phone test it. So new issues, new technology, we've upgraded. We replace all the infrastructure. But I'll tell you, at 9 o'clock at night, you want to look at a hole and be the citizen responsible for figuring out if you got to turn a pump off or on? I didn't. I said, what the hell? I could have fallen in that hole. My wife would have said, where are you? you know? So anyways, we did operate it. Here's a, here's a guy working on the hole in the pipe. We offered the city back to the when we started this discussion that in lieu of the reimbursement of the seven, eight thousand dollars, whatever it was, bill. We'd wait that. We had about twenty third, twenty-five thousand dollars, maybe more, in our escrow account. We'd give that to the city. Just keep it open. We work with you to keep it open. You got the expertise. And what do you gotta do? When there was a sinkhole up halfway up the street, 
at the where they put in the little water rhinos. I took pictures of it. I said, Highway, you couldn't su supervise that down. He says to me, What's up? I said, I just wonder where it is. Oh, it's a fresh pipe. Right where they dug and where they put in? Yeah, that's our week. Okay. But we got any idea when it's going to be done? <sighs> Hell, I don't have people. Okay. What, what do you, what's the plan? We're going to have to hire a contractor. Okay. They hired a contractor. We hired a contractor. This is different. It's still my tax on the table. All we're saying is he knew what to do. He knew how to get it fixed. And didn't have to hire any employees to make it, make it work. So I'm, I'm, I want that off the table. Really, I understand where he's coming from if we put this burden on him. For all we're asking from, from the council to say, this makes sense. Let's instruct the city like they did with the watershed, figure it out, figure out how to do it, and come back to us with a plan. All we had to do was sign a memo and say, yeah, you can do it. If you're going to give us a special fee, which the city manager said, if the city council, the first when we first met, approved this and said, yeah, we're going to take over your pump station, but it would be three stipulations. One is it has to be upgraded. We did that. Did that based on what we knew from the city. Number two, we'd have to order your special fee. Well, we just charged them $705, and they didn't even get a sweep out of anybody in that neighborhood because they knew it had to be done. It was hard. It was right in the middle of December. And a lot of people said, can you give me a couple months to pay it? I said, yes. But we got to fix this. We got to put a new pump in. We got to get this up to speed. Everyone will agree to it. The third thing is we have to get approval and get, get people to I, I, uh, work on this. And I think I don't want to be negative about this. I want to try to stay positive. I think we worked together over the years. And I think we worked together in the last few months on this. I don't see if it takes another six months or less or more, we can still get this done. I'm not asking for a changeover today. I'm asking that we have the funds that we talked to, we did the rework. We can still give the city some funds to help with the easement turnovers or legal returns or whatever. It might. This should be a no cost to say, I see your budget. I know you're having over 20 to 40 hours on a staff member. That the city should have or shouldn't have, but can you do it? You budget. I don't want you to think it's a budget issue. I don't want that to be presented as a budget issue because we never said we wouldn't pay for this. What we said is he works full time. He shouldn't have to stop his day and try to figure this out to get 22 residents, 22 homes, 60 residents. Or Dr. Levi here, or myself, who might be traveling and say, my phone goes off. And I get a call one of them and say, what's that here? Do we have a power failure? Because it will go up in power failure. But it doesn't mean it's a problem. Do I have to get a pump down there to pump it up because it's been there for three or four days? And does the city think, well, now we've taken it over, maybe there is opportunity at the top of the hill for some of those empty lots or empty fields for housing that we've had in need this room. It's not an open shut case. I think it's this room for discussion. It's a room for what we can do for it. And I think the director, public utilities, and everyone has their opinion. But I think it's right for you to say to them, let's open, let's be open-minded about it. Let's rethink this and come back to us what could be done. I think as residents in the community for 30 years, I love the neighborhood. I love working with them. We're a very diverse neighborhood. We have um, neighborhood community party um, at the end. Um, a very close neighborhood. We're just trying to do the right thing. And when that last spill occurred, it could have been worse. And I could have been held liable because I might have been gone for a few days and come back to a disaster and only heard about it. I think it should be in the hands of the city to do the right thing. And again, I don't think any of us feel that we can't pay, pay our fair share to make this work. Any questions for anybody? Let me ask, can you not retain whatever the right word is, water mechanic, <laughs> a person like contract with somebody to maintain this thing for you or to come out when you have issues? Part of the thing that we have done with the city's recommendation with the monitoring systems up there, that monitoring system goes right to the person that 
we'll go out and take a look at it, right, and check on it. The, the point we have is with that, all right, is that the city could do the same thing. And our issue still is with the pipe that busts it. <laughs> I mean, we could do it with, you know, it's nine feet down. They were down three or four feet deep. I mean, I lived down there. So I know about heavy trucks and vehicles, and it's an old, old road. And it didn't, it didn't break anywhere else. It broke in the point where they were working. So, I mean, I find it hard to believe it was a coincidence. Um, but I think I think we we are doing what the city's asked us to do. The question comes up is um, inspections by the state and all those kind of things. You know, we don't know anything about that. We don't know. Yeah, you, know, you know, but we we are working with paying for a maintenance contract for the with the, the crew to come in a couple of years, pump it out, clean it out. All again, the city could assess that fee and come up with their special assessment fee for the neighborhood. And we will all be glad to turn it. The only thing we're association for is to maintain this pump station. And the only thing we're doing bad in that neighborhood is maintaining this pump station. We're not experts. We don't know if you you know change it all the time. We also looked at the fact that it's been thrown back at us at uh, trying to find an alternative to a pump station, running a line down towards Pine Street. I took some pictures both ways. Uh, with new technology, it may, you know, with machines that turn pipes under the ground, it may not be as a basis as some people have, have stated. It might be something that's also as an alternative. Remove the pump stations all together. All together. Now that might take a year or two to even think, think about it. just getting it all looked at and figured out. But um, we're willing to work with the city, and we just ask the city to continue to work with us and uh, look at it from a perspective of rather than no, more like the watershed, we'll keep it in mind. And if there's something we can do about it, we'll do it. And in the city, the right thing. The watershed's amazing what they did and how they did it and what they came up with. And there's still water running down the hill alongside of it from another area, but our water runs into that watershed. <laughs> and so we got the right thing done. It's a good question. Yeah. Well, let me say, I think this at your ask is fairly aligned with just to reiterate from the staff recommendation, like our role in the scenario would be to at a policy level direct staff. Yes, look at these private pumps, not just yours, it would be all of them, or no. And I, I want to re-emphasize re what staff recommended as well, that that's a decision that should be made in concert with our strategic prioritization, because maybe for face value, I think it's a good idea, but we need to also think about the big picture of all the things we're looking at. Um, so if there was council interest in further exploration, I think we would have to pick it up during that discussion. But now would be a good time to, Again, if there are more questions about the scenario or what is being asked to get clarity. So I I could use some clarity. Um, you mentioned the field um, kind of up the hill. And can you just explain to me the what's prohibiting development on, on that right now? Sewage. There's no access to sewage. Okay. So we need a pump station or a booking door. Okay. And did you say you had a sense? Do you have a sense now for your capacity? No. Okay. No. Although it could be very capable of doing it as long as we weren't maintaining it. As long as we weren't, you know, worrying about how others, you know, when you get more people on a system, there's more chances for um, concerns and issues. So I don't know. I mean, I would really have to be upgraded. Would it have to? I think we met the expectations. Um, when we did pump it out, I said, well, what happens if the line goes off and power goes off? They said we could go three days before pumping with the residents we have now. Okay. So that's what we said. Okay. When you, when you mentioned um, working with the other uh, residents at pump stations, I'd like you to really look at this list. 
Um, that list was a little, uh, I don't know, mis misconception for us when you said private pump stations. I find it hard to find that many of those are private pump stations. I don't think the school district is a private pump station. I mean, when you look at those lists, there's only two or three that are probably authentically private pump stations. Well, they're private in the sense that the school is maintaining and operating that and not the city, just as your HOA is. Right, and then, but they have a school budget, which is city votes oh, on it, right? So, right? so I doubt that the city, school district would come to you and say, okay, we want you to take over our pump station. You have a tax base already. That's a different, nowhere, no further would you build your soccer field. So I don't see that as an issue. But I think it's your point is take it is a school district, but it's a it's a separate and it would not be up taken on take the city under under a command for them. I mean you might make a contract with all their driveways to the city, but that would be that's already happened. Yeah, see, so that would be maybe something but then again that wouldn't be a cost to your city budget that would be coming out of school budget <clears throat> on the same the city for, for that would it be okay if i read a little statement as well right before you do that sure. eric yes the empty land at the top of pine grove terrace i think the the quarry owns that um right now yes I on both sides of the street yes Right, so with Mr. Fraga, his understanding is that it's not developable because there's not sewer access, but I, I feel like you've mentioned before that there's other reasons that that land is undeveloped. My understanding is that land is being protected as a buffer uh, to the quarry and is not able to be developed. But there's a restriction of development on it, but I believe it's through their active yard. Okay. But there's two spots. <clears throat> if anybody knows George Cross in the backyard, so there's a big spot between the mailboxes and number one. Yeah, I don't know the, the whole borders. We could get more information, but I just wanted to. Did the, did the quarry at any point in time offer the city that as donating that space to the city for a park? I doubt anyone here has that historic knowledge. Yeah, right. Tom. Okay. Right, that was presented Tom's uh, quite passionate on the subject. He's been thinking about it for 30 years. Still qualified under the Act 250 regulations. The land just has to be green and undeveloped. But I don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole. Um, go ahead, Levi. Thank you. So I'd like to read just a brief comment from Andrew and myself on this topic. Um, and I will say we understand this really isn't your situation to deal with, but uh, we came to you guys after six months of radio silence from the city. So it was kind of a way to get their attention, I guess. Okay. I but uh, we share many of Tom's concerns. Um, we'll try not to belabor the same no points and we'll keep it short. It just seems unusual to us in Vermont's most dense city that volunteers from a neighborhood homes are responsible for transporting their own waste through city property to private property and back to city property. There's a lot of issues associated with this whole agreement. When neighbors want to build in our easement area, we are expected to assess whether or not there will be implications to our sewage infrastructure. When the city repairs property, we should be acting responsible and supervising their work to make sure our assets aren't impacted. If the city brings in heavy equipment, we should assess whether the road can support and protect our assets from the weight. Among many other things Tom mentioned, uh, right now we are solely responsible for this, uh, but I feel like our vendors can't be fully honest and in our corner about this because they need to protect relationships with the city and politics and make their own money. City contractors or workers aren't as focused or concerned with our assets because it doesn't belong to the city and basically it's not their concern. Uh, we recognize the effort Public Works has done uh, to help us, like the EPA report this summer. But seriously, uh, how are a bunch of volunteers supposed to write that up? 
uh, how are we supposed to fulfill all of these obligations responsibly while not uh, being public works people? We're not trained, we're, we're volunteers, we're busy people. Uh, we've been in the, in the neighborhood for two-ish and five-ish years, and it's already apparent to me that the neighborhood HOA model is flawed. Uh, no neighbor wants to be responsible for everyone's waste. No one wanted to be on the HOA. We're doing this reluctantly. Uh, we don't want to be responsible for your toilet flushing. There's many issues with having an HOA. It comes with inconsistent communication between the city and residents, weird neighborhood hierarchies and inequities, uncomfortable boundary issues, uh, among others. Um, lost institutional and historical knowledge uh, when officers burn out or rotate, which happens frequently. And ultimately, it's the lack of time and expertise. We don't have staff, and again, we're not trained. Uh, in 1988, the developers and city uh, agreed to pass this burden onto the neighborhood. And if anyone had wanted to live here, they'd have to accept it. After 35 years, I think Tom and others have paid their dues. Uh, my neighbors have lived through this arrangement and have come to the conclusion that it's not really a good model. Should we be managing this? Should other HOAs be managing this? Uh, you've heard our arguments. I don't. I don't think. Um, I don't think so. My neighbors don't think so. Other residents and people I've talked to in Winooski don't think so. In the end, the city staff is presenting logistical issues and objections, and we hear them. We're living and breathing those very issues. We're here asking for help, uh, talking about what's right and wrong. Please consider making a motion to pursue an alternative to the current waste management responsibility of the Pine Grove Terrace HOA, or help us guide uh, to a mutually beneficial solution within the city. Thank you. Thank you for that. Do the folks have any clarifying questions? I, yeah, I, you, you've said a couple of times that this wouldn't incur any costs on the city, and I just am failing to understand how that would be possible. Well, special yeah. assessments. Go ahead. We don't have, we're not asking for funding through everyone's taxes. Give us special assessments every time something breaks, we'll pay for it. We've already showed that we'll pay for it. We just did one two days before Thanksgiving and everyone paid within two weeks. We just don't want the responsibility. Everyone on the block is willing to pay. So it wouldn't increase a uh, financial burden on yourselves. It would, it'd be the cost, we would uh, pay for it basically. Yeah, how do we collect? We want someone to do the work pay. Yeah, it, how is it our responsibility to go around and collect from our neighbors? What if someone is hostile? How, how do we, why is that put on us? It's, it doesn't make any sense. It, it's dangerous. It could be dangerous. To collect. Someone, negligent? I mean, I didn't pay my taxes one day late. I got a, I got a percentage to pay extra. I get that. Understood. 30 years, I paid on time. I approved this week. But that's the point. There is no one further cost to you folks. We're paying. It's going to be assessed what their fee is. Once that assessment comes, then you know, let's move forward. It, it's not. Now, maybe all the other pump stations you want to reach out to them. Oh, we don't want that anymore. We like what we got. We're handling it. We're only three feet away from the sewer line. We don't worry about it. I think we're all, we're all all the same. all the same. Elaine, do you want to speak to costs or operations? Um, I, I would I would rather not because okay. of my request. Um, yeah, if if you want me to comment on the on the estimated costs, I I will. Well, I feel like in the packet, in response to them, you had noted staff time required and some other things. That was another part of my wonder is, I know that we are understaffed at the moment, so I don't know. Well, let me ask an answer from my perspective. I'm the staff on Pineville Terrace. 
I put 100 hours in collecting. I put 10 hours in contracting a contractor and having him show up and looking at him and doing the job and make sure he did it, who was recommended by the city. Hands done. There is no additional cost. We don't have to hire a new employee to say, oh, I got to get a contractor now for the conversation. Now, when Cranky old is going to want to own the mansion, give me it. I sound too aggressive here. The guy's going to tell me to slow down. <laughs> but my point is, is that, yeah, if you're going to take on pump stations, sure. But you didn't even take on a sinkhole halfway down the street because you didn't have a sack. So what did you do? You contracted it out. On a good year, on a normal year, it's like 10 hours of time to like oversee this station. Most of it's collecting dues and having an annual meeting. When there is an issue like this year, you know, it's a, it's a bit more. But annual, you know, maintenance, it's like 0 0.01 FTE full time equivalent. It's but, not a big commitment. What happened to us losing a pump? Was me going down the alarm going off, <laughs> looking down the hole and saying, I don't know what I do. I, I know I could turn off one pump because the pump holders had fallen into it and it was just drop, running dry. But I burnt that pump out in three days when I called the guy to say, Can you come check it out? Love to, Tom. We've got a subcontractor. And the other guy won't be able to come out for a couple of days. And when he did get there, he says, Oh, I've got a dead pump. A little bit of experience can save a lot of time and money. Someone who knows what they're looking at. Yeah, and I'm sure John knows what he's looking at. He's gone to conventions. He just came back from a convention in the fall, which gave us the idea about the modern station. They have the expertise. They have the knowledge. And I think if, if it amounts to, to being assessed for a contract to have someone monitor it like we're doing now, okay, we're not asking you to the world. We're just local taxpayers who said, all right, we pay highest taxes correctly in the whole city. Sure. When, and we're not going and we're willing to take on additional fee. We just don't want to see a spill go on unnoticed for the weekend. We don't want to have a pipeline that breaks at 500 feet up the road that's under a garage or through a woods or something that we have no way to figure out how to do. Maybe you can run a pipeline up to it. Maybe someone knows that, engineering wise. Maybe somebody said, why do we even do this? Because now they're taking the responsibility and said, you know what? We're going to redo the whole road in a couple of years. That's the worst on the list of the worst roads in Winooski. Why don't we dig up the pipeline and set it up through and get that easement and get and get that done? We might want to do that. But let's say, like, let the experts think about that. But the, what I look for from city council is one comment. Let's, let's keep this open and let's ask the city employees who know who did the uh, water runoff sites and put some considerable time and effort in it and found a grant and made it work 30 years later. Let's at least say, take this on, look at it, come back with something that might be feasible to make it work. That's what we're asking the council to do. When I mean, we voted the council in to, to do things like this, was to listen to their citizens and say, what's the right thing to do? And I listened to you guys the last few months about budgets and everything else. And I said, we are not going to go in here and put this on you guys. All we're asking is that, as city manager first said, I'd say no to the city council because we don't want to take it on. But if we did, there'd be these three options. We looked at that and said, okay, that's open minded. Let's do those three options. And we worked on it. We did the infrastructure, we put a ton of money into it, we fixed things, we put a monitoring on. We're doing what we think is in good faith. All we're asking the city to come back and say, why well, we can in good faith take a good look at this? Let's take a look at it as if we would do it and see what we can come up with. Yeah, we may have come out a little aggressive after six months of not hearing back in our in our original email. So it seems that the city has been on the defensive kind of. But we're, all we're really looking for is some collaboration and perhaps maybe not just a hard no, but can you give us an estimate of how much it, a, a monthly tax would be if you were to take it over or something? Just consider us uh, 
you know, yeah, or so, at our liability yeah, in yeah. terms of our easement requirements and where our responsibility starts and stops. I just want to say, like, I hear the logic here, the concerns you have, the request you're making. I don't think tonight we're giving a hard no, but I, I would not be a fan of giving a yes to direct staff to spend their time and resources trying to figure out those details at this point. I think that's a decision we have to make in a bigger picture discussion. And I think there's also more to consider here and the implications of this being an HOA and like, what are the lines between when the city, what precedent are we setting of the city taking over maintenance or whatever issues from HOAs because they don't feel um, like they're equipped to handle that. So I think there's just a lot of reflection that I need to do before I can make a decision. Well, good. I, I, I that's all that. Yeah, that's great. Really, Thank you. A lot of reflection on figure this out. Right? <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I understand. I mean, we went back and forth with the city manager. Then we started, you know, six months later, getting a lot more documentation that we even knew existed. And so we've learned a lot. And I learned a lot about pump stations that I never really wanted to know. <laughs> you know, but I think I think you're in the right path for us. Yeah, with that kind of concept coming back and asking us to come back. And saying we're looking at this, even if it's a if, if the city had a policy to say we would accept HO under this guideline, then everybody can look at that guideline and say, well, that's not what where we want to do. Well, that would be that would work for us too. With that kind of balance, then it's a choice. It's given the city's given the choice. I mean, oh. apply for a permit to find them. Our I other member is online. Okay. I just noticed there's a hand in Zoom. Um, if we can bring Catherine over. Hi, <laughs> Welcome. Um, my name's, thank you. My name's Catherine Bergeron Radu. Um, I've been watching the whole meeting. <laughs> um, I just wanted to come on, first of all, to say that I'm here and um, I am the secretary with the HOA, but I have been here since 2015 and seen um, just the progression of changes throughout the neighborhood. And we are a very tight knit community. Um, I echo everything that's been said by my fellow HOA members um, and the, the board of directors. And I just wanted to kind of piggyback on what Levi said and all, I mean, ultimately what Andrew and um, Tom said as well, that our concern is not one of cost savings. Um, our concern is one of environmental impact and really ultimately cost savings, not to us, but as a whole. So if we had more experience in how to manage something like a pump station, I think we've all learned more than we've ever wanted to know and ever will want to know, um, then the fixes could have come sooner, the impact on the street could have been decreased and the total financial cost <laughs> to us would have been decreased as well. Um, and I think a lot of that had to do with time to resolve the issues that came up that we knew very little about. And so we needed an intermediary, right? So we were just basically an extra step in the process to getting these fixes resolved. And we're not looking to diminish our cost in this. We're looking to diminish our the role we play in slowing down the process to repair anything that happens with the pump station. And that can then impact our community. Um, if any of you aren't familiar with our neighborhood, it leads directly down into the pump station and that pump station sits directly above Landry Park. In fact, there's a trail that leads from the pump station directly down to the skate park and down into the park and then further on to the pool. Um, personally, I would hate to see anything happen down there that happened as a result of us not knowing what the correct next steps were to take because we were waiting on expertise from either a contractor, the city, the EPA, what have you, and we just want to take that delay out of the equation. So again, it's, it's not one of financial responsibility, it's one of expertise responsibility. So we thank you um for taking these these concerns into consideration thanks Catherine. i appreciate that sort of summary 
in, in our case, too, don't forget on the table is our escrow fund to help transition. I don't know if other that could be a, a part of your protocol. Is there funding to help transition the um, transition of uh, S easements, legal fees, whatever that we mentioned that might be included? We are willing to put that on the table too. We're we're moving forward best we can in the in the in the way of I know how the city works. I was on the school board for a I know the budget issues, I know the concerns, and I've driven around the whole neighborhood the last few days. So I know where we're at as a community. Can I ask what kind of timeline you're thinking about? We do our strategic prioritization in uh, late May, early June every year. Oh, cool. Yeah, oh, that's pretty good. Yeah, that's pretty good. Thanks. Well, I talk too much, but I appreciate you listening. Yeah, thanks, thanks for clarifying. Man. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Were there any? I don't know okay. any okay. questions I have for answers. So You're, thank you. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We will move on to item E. Oh, sorry. I'll let you guys <laughs> grab your stuff first. Okay, item E, Main Street Revitalization Construction Phase Services Approval. Great. Good evening, everyone. Um, so this, I kind of previewed this in the last meeting with the bond bank resolution. So the this is for the next phase of uh, construction engineering services for the Main Street project. So this will cover um, the remaining scope of our consultants, including uh, the resident engineering throughout the, the construction um, phase work. And it, it's also going to provide bidding supports, construction administration, um, and some of the uh, like post-construction support. So this proposal was reviewed by all our finance um, stakeholders. So USDA, uh, the DEC SRF folks, and we've incorporated their comments. So, um, and it does include, uh, I, I provide a breakdown. So financing wise, general funds, we, we approved that, the, the bond resolution last meeting for the 814,700. The remaining scope of this uh, $1,783,322 1, is uh, water resources funded scope. So. 278,430 is water fund scope, and then 690, uh, 192 is sewer fund scope. That will all get rolled, in, rolled into the USDA financing, so that's how that uh, scope is funded. And this is all within the, the approved $23 million uh, bond. This is part of that budget work. Um, I also have Evan Dietrich from Beach. Um, I think I saw him in the participants. I'm here, John. Great. So Evan is our, our project manager from BHB, so he can also answer any questions you have on, on the proposal. Thank you, John. Yep. Are there any questions from council? Uh, so your financial partners reviewed this. I, I missed it if you said our legal counsel reviewed it. Yes, so this is actually the, the contract we use is, is what's called the EJ CDC format. So our attorney reviewed that, that. So this is a continuation of an existing contract basically. And then we did have our city attorney just re-review the insurance requirements to make sure that was all set. Okay. And I should say, uh, I guess the ask is actually, so the ask tonight is to authorize the city manager to execute the contract. Are these insurance terms standard for a project of this scope? Yes.
Are there any questions from members of the public in attendance? All right. Hearing no other questions or concerns, would someone like to make a motion to approve authorizing the city manager to execute the construction phase services amendment for VHB? I move. Second. Motion by Jim, second by Thomas. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Forward progress here. All right, so next up item F, Lot 70 Municipal Garage Bond Revolution. Resolution. Struggling, excuse me. <laughs> it's a revolutionary bond. So in January 2019, I'm just reading from the memo, so if you're ready, you can check out for a minute here. Uh, city Council decided that the city would be served by a new parking garage on Abenaki Way. In March 2019, voters authorized bonding for that garage of up to $9.7 million. In 2020, the city entered into a development agreement with Netty Real Estate LLC for the redevelopment of Lot 70 in the downtown. Um, the street address is 17 Abenaki Way for anyone who wants to understand what Lot 70 actually means. Um, that uh, is to include a parking garage. In late 2022, citing recent inflation, Netty Real Estate requested more funds from the city for the parking garage. On December 5th, 2022, council voted to commit $11.4 million for the garage on Lot 7D to seek financing or alternative funding up to the $11.6 million for the garage on Lot 7D as outlined in Netty Real Estate's December 5th, 2022 financing proposal with some contingencies and authorized the city manager to enter into an agreement with Echo Financial Products to manage a request for financing proposals. We did receive three proposals from three banks. After some negotiation and clarification with the banks, Echo Financial Products recommended the city select the Northfield Savings Bank proposal. The city's bond council has prepared the necessary documents which were enclosed in your packet. To proceed, city council must authorize A, incurrence of debt via the resolution enclosed, and B, execution of remaining documents. Uh, you'll, note, you'll have noted that the enclosed agreement and notes are in draft form with options because the interest rates are changing every day. So the motion is awarded or worded to allow staff to optimize the final financing arrangement. Thank you, Elaine. Any questions from council? <clears throat> I have one very little thing, which might be more of a um, correction. Um, I noticed it mentions a meeting on January 28th, 29th. Never mind, actually. I answered my own question. I, I read the same thing. Yeah. Anything else? I just want to note in the cover sheet, just for folks who might be watching, there's the 11.6 and 11.4 amounts, but the resolution is still for that bond amount. So this is the, the debt being incurred is still below that amount approved by voters. I think that just wanted to call that out for, for this discussion. Thank you, Jim. Any questions from members of the public? Okay. Uh, hearing no concerns, would someone like to make a motion to adopt the resolution, authorize the city manager to conclude and the mayor to execute the financing agreement based on one or all of the options in the agreement, provided substantial conformance with options listed in the enclosed agreement? So moved. Second. Motion by Thomas, second by Bryn. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Another step. I will say I want to appreciate... Uh, Bill Niquette for telling us about this option. It wasn't something I knew you could do to request financing proposals based on our best interest. And um, it certainly paid off. And they and Echo did quite a did quite a bit of a negotiation on our behalf. It was a very uh low touch interaction. And want to underline again. So during those discussions, Echo pointed out that we were in a good position partly because of the financial. Stat, um, situation we're in and the reporting that Angela manages. 
uh, gives confidence to lenders that they can lend to us because we're fiscally manageable. So I want to credit staff for that, specifically Angela. Kudos. Okay. Let's move to item G, resolution setting fees for community services programs in Thrive. Hey, um, so I'm not sure if everyone here has gone through this process with us in the past, but um, per our city charter, any fees that are uh, levied are required to be set in ordinance. And so uh, through our ordinance, chapter 28, we have provisions in there that require us to come back to city council um, annually to set the rate for Thrive and then for any other additional fees for programming um, that are not already previously established. So that is what we are here to do tonight. Um, so a couple things to note here um, that are you know also captured in the cover sheet, but wanted to just um, talk about in person. So the rate for Thrive summer, we are proposing to increase uh, from $160 per week to $225 per week for full week care. Um, and that is to mirror the updated base rates for state subsidy, which were changed uh, in early July of 2022. Uh, what that allows us to do is maximize the drawdown for families that are uh, accessing subsidy, of which it depends on the year, but a third to a half roughly of our families are accessing subsidy at any given time. Um, and so for us financially, that's beneficial. But also wanted to note that given the uh, anticipated presence of ESSER funding for this coming summer, uh, out-of-pocket impact for families will remain uh, at zero for summer programming. So for families, this, this shouldn't hit anybody's uh, wallets. This is really an opportunity for us to maximize drawdown from the state. Um, conversely, we've not, um, we're not recommending to increase the rates for after school. We did just do that fairly recently and are finding that, uh, the current after school rates, I think are, um, comfortably where they need to be. I think we're seeing good enrollment, but also hearing from families that an increase could become challenging and problematic for, for after school care for Thrive. Um, and then the other pieces that are included here in the resolution are, um, non-resident rates for recreation summer camps at $200 a week, and then a slight increase for the cost of swim lessons for non-residents um, over previous years. So I'm happy to answer any questions that folks have. Thanks, Ray. Yeah. Um, so question about timing. Um, we had talked about some other ordinance, and this may be best for the city manager. Um, we had talked about some other potential ordinance fee changes. So just curious about the timing of this versus yep. you want to consider all fee changes at the same time because that so yeah, good question. Good. Yep, yep. So these are not these are not reflective of a change to the ordinance. These are in response to ordinance language that asks us to come to council and set fees by resolution. So this doesn't directly impact that ordinance change that we are talking about in the future. This okay. is already captured an ordinance that says fees will be set time to time by resolution. Okay, so for clarification, so the other fees that we were talking about are specifically stated in the ordinance where here it's just saying we need to come back to council for Correct. 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 Yeah. Correct. Okay, thank you. Yep, and just for history, Bryn, the reason we did that was basically every time we wanted to run a new program, we didn't want to have to come back and do an ordinance update. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? I just have a clarification question. Sure. On the group swim lessons, right? Mm -hmm. The $105 a session, is a session like a day of swimming? Great question. So those are six-week sessions um, with one hour, well, depending on the age group, uh, 30 minutes to one hour per week for that. So it's a six six-week session. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. Any questions from members of the public? Oh, they're gone. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I have a motion to approve the resolution setting fees for community services programs and thrive. So moved. Second. Motion by Aurora, second by Thomas. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So it is 8 26 p.m. I am going to call a recess on our city council meeting for. I have to say a time, don't I? A five-minute um, recess. To, to enter as the just board of trustees? 
Yeah. Do I have to recess the council meeting? Yes. And I, you don't, I don't think you have to set a duration. For okay. Recess. So it's 826 PM. I will recess the city council meeting and I will call to order the Winooski Community Development Trust Board of Trustees meeting. We have one regular item on for discussion approval, the Winooski Community Development Trust FY24 allocation. Yes, so the Winooski Community Development Trust used to have an independent board of trustees. That organization received tax increment revenue. The board of trustees has since dissolved and turns its, turned its assets over to the city. So city council serves as the trustees of the Winooski Community Development Trust. Uh, staff recommend council receive the Winooski Community Development revenue and allocate those revenues back to the city's general fund for the community development budget. And as a prelude to that, as part of the city council's approved FY24 budget, $200,000 was budgeted again to the Winooski Community Development Trust from the tax increment financing budget as debt payments on the existing note. Do folks have questions? Um, only about if there's a way to do this differently in the future. <laughs> it's only, Angela, I think this is only for one more year, right? Yeah. This is uh, yeah. This is actually the last year that you'll okay. need to do this um, because <laughs> oh, we're approving it for the FY twenty four budget, um, and this is actually recommended to us by legal counsel um, in response to a state audit finding. Great. <laughs> Problem solved. Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> That's good news. Okay, do I have a motion to approve FY24 Winooski Community Development Trust allocation in the amount of $200,000 to the general fund for the community development budget? So moved. Second. Motion by Bryn, second by Jim. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. That is the end of the trustees meeting agenda. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Motion by Jim, second by Thomas. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. It is 8.28 p.m. I will now reconvene the Winooski City Council meeting. We are on item A, FY24 Community Development Fund budget. So the for the sake of your City Council minutes, um, on December 5th, uh, 20, 2022, the City Manager, meaning me, uh, presented an overview of the fiscal year 2024 proposed budget to City Council. Since that meeting, Council has received presentations from each department. And uh, this time I'm asking council to approve that uh, community development fund budget as presented. Any questions? All right, do I have a motion to approve the FY24 community development fund budget as presented? So moved. Second. Motion by Jim, second by Bryn. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Nothing carries. Last time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> We are on to item B, equity next steps for council. So I'll introduce and then pass it along. Um, <laughs> at our last meeting, we reviewed policy equity assessment tools in use around Vermont. Um, we would like to adopt one for ourselves. Councilor Heard presented a draft tool she put together, I'm sorry, they put together using those other options. Um, counselors had the opportunity to review and suggest edits following the meeting. So we have a revised version attached here. Um, the Inclusion and Belonging Commission will review this at their upcoming meeting. So tonight we could choose to adopt what exists now um, and revisit it if there are substantial suggestions from the commission. We could wait until after they've had a review. And we could also wait if there are more revisions that we want to make tonight. So, Aurora, would you like to do a quick overview of the tool again? Yeah. So this is thinking about, again, a tool for reviewing policy budgets, strategies, and priorities going forward. Um, some of the changes that were made is to put some specific language in about kind of what kind of protected groups and protected classes um, and marginalized communities uh, we're intending to cover with this and make sure that we're moving forward equitably in these different ways. And following that, there are just a bunch of questions getting at those specific areas. I think there was a slight move um, 
clarifying purpose has been moved from, I think, item three to item one, and everything else kind of shifted down from there. So the idea then would be to really start clarifying the purpose of the policy, procedure, strategy, priority, or budget, and then identify and plan outreach to the stakeholders, um, consider impacts, and my one question here is kind of, do we want to include considering impacts kind of more than once just to check in? Um, and one item uh, under considering adverse impacts is specifically thinking about racial equity, just to kind of acknowledge the, the need of that in, um, in the city's work. And then finally, there's examining alternatives or improvements. So that's if there is a concern that is kind of raised or if there could be ways that positive impacts could be increased. And finally, kind of an audit process at the end to make sure during a final vote that all kind of all these considerations have been taken into account before um, you know, putting a policy in place. I think that covered it. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions or was there any additional feedback from counselors? Um, I'll first off, start with some appreciation, Aurora, for uh, Councilor Herb, for doing this um, and, and making these changes. I really appreciate what you've put together here. And I only question I wanted to ask was around including the practice and the goal is used throughout and evaluating practices. And I'm curious what, um, if you speak more to kind of what was intended there. And what the, how that would differentiate from a policy budget or strategy priority policy. Gotcha. Let me see. So I think it's in, in the goal, the first line of the goal statement, and then further down the audit stage, I think it shows up as well. That is a good question and might be one that maybe we want to specify the language to replace where it says practice with strategies and priorities. Um, thinking about our city context in particular, that might be holdovers from some of the other okay. languages. So I think that I'm going to mark that down. Let's replace it with strategic priorities. Yeah. Great. And I found the other location is in. Um, I lost it again. Section course. three, <laughs> bullet four. Yes. Thank you. Um, I did want to raise a question about in the protected groups, and I think, Elaine, you shared this from somewhere, I forget. VLCT. VLCT. The, the term for physical and mental attributes, um, I'm not sure how, if you have any knowledge of how that's been interpreted in the past. I have a minor concern that it would be it's like vague in the way that character of the neighborhood is and keeps coming up as a problem in some of our other work. But I might be over concerned. Did does it that's funny. Did I did the physical and mental attributes, did that language come from the VLCT as well? Yeah, I think it's that this is the thing that you pasted in the chat for us. It's funny, I don't remember having what the conversation was about those two items. Because I would have thought it would be covered under the disability term. Yeah, I noticed that there, are the um, covered groups are different also in our declaration of inclusion. Oh, do you have that open now? I do. What do we have in there? So okay. This feels more broad, but where are the differences? Um, race, color, religion, national origin. Oh, we don't have religion in this one. And then the other thing that's different from this is the list, the VLCT list, which is, I don't have this in a lot of format, sorry. The, <coughs> Oh, you're right, it is from Mills. Socioeconomic status, religion. Is religion in that one? Yeah, it's kind of a, it's got a oh. space. 
Oh, so that might have just not oh, yeah. Value systems or in the VLCT list. Oh, you know, so that one some... I was concerned about too in, in a similar fashion. So there's just some inconsistencies is, yeah. why, is the only thing I'm pointing out between, it's different in three locations. Right. And I don't know what would be the best way forward in that regard. Yeah. I think ideally consistency, but I, I believe, um, Mayor Lott, one of your comments was maybe we want to use more of the VLCT language kind of going forward and even. I think it'll align us more to other stuff, other activities, other places, and it's broader than what we adopted initially in that resolution. So sounds like what we might want to is add religion back in, but maybe remove the physical and mental attributes. Because to my mind, that would be covered under the disability. Yeah. And I appreciate the little parentheses in there too. Yeah. I believe it would, there's some other changes. Like I believe it would remove political beliefs from the BLCT. They don't have that one? No. No, wait, sorry. I apologize. The font's so small. It is really small. Uh, it won't get bigger. I know I won't. I, I'm, I'm, I'm unable weird. to. Yeah. Yeah. As much was a, as I try. It was a screenshot and I couldn't. I couldn't no worries. You did a great job. <laughs> I'm just happy I have it to reference, even yeah. if it's small. So thank you. The other ones that we haven't included are sexual orientation or marital status. I think we have sex, uh... sexual orientation. Sexual orientation. I, I, I was looking yeah. at the inclusion but statement. Or it's so we may need the declaration to come back to council about a future date for updating. Yep, there it is. Okay. Could we reference our conclusion statement from this and use that as the foundational document rather than duplicating it? I I usually think it's recommended, um, a recommended practice for policies to refer to other policies. It would be just a matter of like ensuring that it's easily, we can easily find it. I would, I would hate to see this fall out of step or go further and like I don't know, just an idea. What were you what were you saying? Uh just strike all the language and just reference our statement of inclusion and, and list, link to like, it and then are adopt those that. listed in in the groups meant for, groups resolved for in our statement of welcoming to all persons regardless of race, color, religion. Like that's this language then becomes kind of incorporated into here by virtue of the resolution yeah i can find that because i know we made some edits and i can find the inclusion uh declaration of inclusion anywhere on the website really easily accessible and i might just have missed it um but i think if it that would be helpful to both those kind of maybe on our equity page that we could link back to and I think kind of jumping on to Jim, what you're thinking of, if we're going to reference that, we could also reference our land acknowledgement statement too, and kind of include both of those as things to keep in mind. Or like goals we have already set out and making sure we're aligning with them. And that could be something I could add, bring up with the 
inclusion and belonging commission and just see if they they have if they feel like it would be really important to include the language within the document or if it would be better to kind of link out i think that's a good question So I think what I'll do is I'll add religion back in, remove physical and mental attributes, and then offer kind of the either or to um, the commission. Um, Can we add marital status to that as well? Yeah. Thanks. Is there enough clarity in the goal statement? Um, as to whose role it is. I, I mean, I understand used by goal, but for someone that's not working in and with this um, document on a regular basis, would it be oh. like what what like what expectations I guess would would come from this? So my interpretation is anytime. We are doing a policy update when we go through our annual prioritization and our annual budget. This document is attached to the agenda item to prompt us to do this thinking and have these discussions. We put in language like maybe even specifically have those examples. So like including but not limited to like thinking about the budget, thinking about st strategies and priorities. Um, and any policy changes, and then we have those specifics, but then leave room with that touch on. I guess what I guess what I'm looking for is like for purposes of discussion or whether or not it would be captured in the form of a memo. Gotcha. Is it something that someone fills out ahead of time that we then discuss right. or during the process itself as council, we go through this list? Right. Yeah. Uh, I think, I think what I would lean to is kind of involve having the list within the discussion. It's like initial discussions itself and work on filling it out as a whole council and maybe think about moving that, like if we have different expertise. Um, but I feel like it's valuable to kind of specifically have within a discussion. I think we have to start there anyway. Like we can't ask staff to right. fill this out for us no. and it's new for us. So I'd like to ease into it. I think that would work. And then say if we have an equity director someday, um, that might be, it might be a tool to kind of partner with some staff expertise. But for now, yeah, I don't think we have this, we don't want to burden the staff um, with something that they don't have capacity for. Can I ask, potentially consider revising the cover sheet to include a staff recommendation of whether this is reviewed, like whether council go through the equity assessment on a given policy program item? Like that could be a way to institutionalize it into our written documents. And that's, like, it's just a link that says, like, here's a link to your equity assessment, and staff thinks this is minor or this is major and you need to review it. Um, so we get just thinking about how it gets kind of baked in instead of like being lost three months or four months from now. Yeah. But it doesn't require staff to actually fill out the assessment, just say like, council, you should look at your own assessment and do it. And one thing I noticed um, just in our own agenda tonight that um, things that are brought forward by the city manager have a cover sheet, but uh, things that are brought forward by council are memos. Staff does not do cover sheets for us. And so I've historically used a memo. My point being to Council well, Duggan's saying, yeah. request that that doesn't cover the council portion of right. agenda items. Um, so budget and strategy and priority would come from staff. Like those would come in cover sheets. Policy, policy usually comes from staff too, if it's like, 
like city policy, like policy that we've brought forward is like how we operate, you know? So there is some onus on us then to keep this on our radar. But like when we were doing like scholarship policy or something like that, like that comes from staff with a cover sheet. We can also amend our rules or our rules of procedures to require a cover sheet submission with a request for an agenda item from a counselor. And right now it's just like, want this on the agenda and I provide you one sentence or several pages, right? Um, so we could, for items that are coming from counselors, could ask for a, a simpler cover, cover sheet potentially, but that includes that. So Does that make sense, Elaine? I don't know if there's a reason we've always had separate processes. But, uh, you mean oh, in like terms of the you cover using sheet? cover sheets for staff and then you just make requests and send memos to you. Well, so from my perspective, it's, if it's from council, I like the point of my cover sheet is to introduce something from staff, but you are not staff. It's your prerogative to introduce items. So it it's, I would be subverting your role to be able to prove um, provide information to council directly by providing the cover sheet myself. So I don't hear that that's what Councilor Duncan is proposing. Is that correct? Yeah, I would say that the counselor fills out right. a cover sheet that might just be a title, a date, and maybe background information and should an equity assessment be included. So because all agendas are set by me, ultimately, I would expect that this, you would you would be directing the city manager to remind whatever counselor or mayor um, proposed the item that there was this thing that yeah. you should look at. So to, a reminder to you to put it in whatever memo you got going to council. Right. But we could bake that into our rules and procedures. Yeah, I appreciate you trying to proceduralize it. Because then it's something that you can point to and say, no, I'm sorry, I can't accept this until you follow your own procedure, which I think we would, I think would be helpful. I see. Yep. And it gives a degree of accountability to council. So all of that gets away from, I think, what started this is your, your the content um, <laughs> right around, like, what is it? Do we have to say what this is being used, like, what the output of this is? I feel like there was some comfort or some discussion that gave me comfort as to whether or not um, the uses uh, should be fully documented, like line by line, point by point, or whether or not it should be brought forward as a discussion item. And I think um, I there are a number of things like, I, I think overall, I wanna hear from the Inclusion and Belonging Commission. Um, and I appreciate the recommendation, recommendation of the mayor to let's frame this as discussion first and kind of walk before we run. We can codify it as we go. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe in the goal, I could just add a brief line on expectations, like expectations that this would be used on policy, budget, strategies, and priorities, and other areas where applicable. Or is that still? I think not, in terms of the goal, not for now. I think in terms of the goal, that's fine. But I'm comfortable with that. Like applied in discussions of. Yeah. Yep. I think that makes sense. Is it as simple as at the end of the goal? It's just these questions will be discussed during agenda items related to the above uses. Yeah. Nice. Jim, throw them down. Last one. Last meeting. <laughs> Don't ask me to say it again, though. <laughs> it's all right. It's being recorded. <laughs> I 
So how do we feel about getting these changes, getting this reviewed by our commission and then adopting it with our new council? Yes. I'm comfortable with that. Okay. Yep. So no motions for this tonight. We will revisit it. All right, thank you. Okay, we are on to item XC, the city manager review process. Councilor Heard, would you like to introduce? Yes, so at our last meeting oh, on Jan or on our meeting on January 23rd, uh, Mayor Lott presented a memorandum proposing uh, the process for an annual review for the city manager. Part of the intent of doing it now is that the uh, re uh, review is being done before we have any turnover in council to kind of um, ensure consistency and um, I guess kind of avoid any bias of the, or not knowledge of an incoming counselor. Um, the timeline was slightly shifted from the initial initial recommendation. Uh, the evaluation tool was sent out to uh, the leadership team as well as uh, the council on January 27th. Uh, the due date was uh, February 10th. It was extend extended a little bit to allow for additional time. Um, and then I compiled the results and sent them out to council on February 12th. Um, a couple things that I want to flag is we are missing two reviews, our two department head reviews. So um, I think that should definitely, uh, because we're such a small team, two things missing, uh, that can that, 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 that should just be kept in mind as we go through the process. And definitely thinking about how we might improve this for the future of kind of building in some more accountability. I think the anonymous nature has um, a lot of benefits, but still probably want to build in some process to have that accountability. So either an additional little survey that's just like name checkbox, I did the thing, um, would I think be my recommendation at this time. Um, and then the final part as we kind of go into this is making sure we know any changes. Um, and then my thought is like, I, I can volunteer to go back and create copies of the most recent process and edit those into templates that we can just copy and move using forward with the changes already in them to kind of prevent, um, to yeah, provide more consistency going forward. That is fantastic of you to volunteer for that. And I did finally find notes from our last process. So we don't have to change. So okay, thank you for that. Um so we've worn an executive session to actually dig into this, but if there's any like general questions or anything before. Okay. So I'm looking for a motion to find that pursuant to 1 BSA section 3133, uh, appointment or employment or evaluation of a public officer employee, provided that the public body shall make a final decision in open meeting and shall explain the reasons for its final decision during the open meeting. I'm sorry, this, this is poorly worded on my part. <laughs> that we can have this discussion in executive session because it is about employee performance. Any actual votes or decisions would happen in, in public though. So I'm looking for a motion to find that. To move. Second. Motion by Bryn, second by Thomas. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. And then I'm looking for a motion to enter into executive session inviting city manager Elaine Wong. So moved. Second. Motion by Thomas, second by Aurora. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. So we will enter into executive session now to discuss this topic. Um, no other topics will be discussed. And when we exit executive session, it will solely be to adjourn the meeting.